His lordship's cushioned throne was wide enough to accommodate three men of common girth, yet Manderly threatened to overflow it. His lordship sagged into his seat, his shoulders slumped, his legs splayed, his hands resting on the arms of his throne as if the weight of them were too much to bear. Gods be good, thought Davos, when he saw Lord Wyman's face. This man looks half a corpse. His skin was pallid, with an undertone of gray. Kings and corpses always drew attendance, the old saying went. So it was with Manderly. Left of the high seat stood a maester nigh as fat as the lord he served, a rosy-cheeked man with thick lips and a head of golden curls. Sir Marlin claimed the place of honor at his lordship's right hand. On a cushioned stool at his feet perched a plump pink lady. Behind Lord Wyman stood two younger women, sisters by the look of them. The elder wore her brown hair bound in a long braid. The younger, no more than fifteen, had an even longer braid, dyed a garish green. None chose to honor Davos with a name. The maester was the first to speak. You stand before Wyman Manderley, Lord of White Harbor and Warden of the White Knife, Shield of the Faith, Defender of the Dispossessed, Lord Marshal of the Mander, a Knight of the Order of the Green Hand. That's a big title, and it's a big man holding those big titles, and his family has held those big titles for a big, well, long time. The head of House Manderley, current head of House Manderley, Lord Wyman, as you would know well, has many traits commonly found amongst his ancestors. Many of them are well on display here in this opening quote. This itself is a theme. Uh, for George R. R. Martin, among the houses of Westeros, we've all seen recurring characteristics, both genetic and cultural, and we've come to expect and enjoy that. But in the case of House Manderly, some of these recurring traits are at least seemingly contradictory, in certain lights anyway. For example, they have a long tradition of ambition, but also a long tradition of loyalty. Those two things don't always go well together, but they can. The Manderleys have pulled it off. But they also have a tradition of tradition. <laughs> Of course, their most popular and well-known set of contradictions relate to them being a powerful northern house from the south, which is very much on display in the opening quote, right? Especially taking into account the fuller descriptions of House Manderley and their court given elsewhere. Any way you look at it, it does not even remotely resemble anything else we see in the north in both style, culture, and, and wealth, really. The Manderleys worship the seven. They buy into the idea of knighthood. Despite being in a land where tradition is everything, their traditions are different. There are countless examples from the gruff, beardy Northmen that they don't exactly take warmly to Southerners in their flowery seats. Yet by the time of the series, the Manderleys seem to have been perfectly integrated into Northern society. And the millennia-old families rarely, if ever, mention that the merman comes from waters down under. But we do hear their leader meaningfully declare that the North remembers, and we love it. We cheer for it. We applaud. That's a, there's a reason that's the most popular chapter in all of the Song of Ice and Fire, at least by certain metrics. It's part of what makes them interesting and fun. After all, if you mix the North and the South, you can kind of take the best of both worlds. Like, Northern Knights, that just sounds really cool. And Bran would totally agree with that. He loves Knights. But it's also fair to say this combination can give you the worst of both worlds, right? Like, the phrase would agree with that, or you'd agree if I refer to the phrase in that light. And you'll see that these are not really contradictions at all. Once we look at them under the microscope, it turns out that they're really just a set of traits and characteristics that we're not used to seeing together. It's part of how George R. R. Martin challenges us to reconsider what normal means, while giving us a chance to see what northern and southern mixing looks like, something we'll get to do again in a not-too-distant future episode on House Blackwood, who, of course, followed something of a opposite path. They went from the north to the south, while also maintaining a lot of their old culture, maintaining their old religion, and things like that. And both of these houses have had a long time to adjust to their new surroundings, and in many ways they have. In most ways they have. But in some other ways, some very significant other ways, it's kind of like they never left their old home. So if nothing else, this should alert us to the shrewdness and ambition of this family through the ages. Not only were they late to the party, but the Manderleys have pretty much overtaken all the other northern families, except for the Starks, well, maybe right now they're doing better than the Starks, but you know what I mean. And they've done this in a really interesting way. They were gifted with the defense of a river, the ruling of the North's only city, and thus became the wealthiest family above the neck, in theory. That kind of thing doesn't happen by accident. So how did they do it? 
did they rub other families the wrong way in the process? What about their ancient origins? Why did they get kicked out of the South in the first place? That and far, far more will be all uncovered in today's episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to History of Westeros podcast. It's so awesome to be back with you all again. Valar back again us? Hmm. I got to come up with something for that. I got the outro with Valar reread us, but I need something for the beginning. I'll work on that. A reminder that you can shop through Amazon on History of Westeros' website, historyofwesteros.com. Anything you purchase through any of the Amazon links will track back to us. And there's a lot of great stuff out there. Right now, I'm recommending the Expanse series, which is back on TV again uh, very shortly here in April 2018. Book 7 just came out. The books are well ahead of the TV show, as you might expect. And Book 7 was awesome. The first six books were awesome, too. Amazon's a great way to get them. You can also listen to them on audiobook. Through Amazon, we've got Audible links as well, and you can get two free downloads if you start an Audible trial, and you don't have to pay a dime. You can keep those two free books if you don't stick with it, but if you do, you get more free downloads every month. Sponsors like that are great for us, but the thing that's most consistent and most important for History of Westeros is our Patreon supporters. So thanks to History of Westeros' first sword, Jeff Gnarly, the Long Snapper, and of course, our dragon riders. We have Lord Mark of House Joseph, the Snow in Winterfell, rider of Mazla Cartho, a white dragon with green scales, horns, wings, and talons. We have Talanis the Talon, King of Gagasos, rider of Talarius, a red dragon with scales, horns, and talons of Midnight Black. Jinx of House Lyre, Green Queen of the Rainwood, rumored daughter of a woods witch, rider of Erogenia, a Sylphic albino dragon with amethyst eyes and opalescent wings. Now, we choose episodes based on a variety of reasons. Beyond the obvious, which is new material, which we always talk about, that always takes precedence, there's a wide range of other factors. From fan and patron voting, popular demand, or just quite bluntly, whatever topic is the most interesting and inspiring to me personally at the time. There's not really a formula to all this. People outside this fandom often express surprise <laughs> that we keep doing this show, History of Westeros, despite the lack of books and or because the show is not in season. <laughs> now, though it's entirely impolite to laugh in someone's face for being so, so wrong, <laughs> I think it's pretty funny anyway. When I expressed just now that we sometimes have a hard time with topic selection, did I sound like someone with too few options or too many? If you answered the latter, you win a cookie. An easy cookie, that was not challenging enough for a tough cookie. The point, or the bottom line here, is that we will never, never run out of topics. There isn't just a huge list of untapped topics. There's a huge list of categories of untapped topics. A picture is worth a thousand words is said on earth, but I prefer a line from Westeros. A reader lives a thousand lives. Can I get an amen? Hmm? That's a meta statement too, because George R. R. Martin has given us such a rich backstory. That quote is almost literally true. We could go through a thousand different characters in A Song of Ice and Fire and A Song of Ice and History and, well, well, that's all really. We, we could do that. We could go through a thousand different characters in A Song of Ice and Fire and A Song of Ice and Fire History. But I'm preaching to the choir, though, here, aren't I? This is something that people who aren't regular listeners need to hear. You guys know this already. But it wasn't a ramble entirely. It was a preamble. Expanding and growing is what House Manderly is all about. So maybe I should have seen it coming by it. I mean that this was supposed to be one episode, and it grew to become two. The ancient history side of this turned out to be far more juicy than expected. And that was a pleasant surprise, though it did delay the release of this episode. But I think you'll see that it's worth it. Anyone who's followed us for a long time, or even a short time, you know this happens. It's not uncommon. You know, many of our older episodes were planned as one and became two or even more. And that's part of what we love about the series, is that we there's a very good chance when we tackle a new topic that we're going to find a ton that we weren't expecting. And speaking of older episodes that I just mentioned, some of the very first, which are not easily found these days because of the lower quality, we made them back in 2012, etc. We didn't really know what we were doing. They're not on iTunes or YouTube anymore, but, but they were house histories, a lot of these early ones. So we've kind of come full circle back to that in a way. So we have an endless source of topics, many of which are themselves endless. And one of these topics within the topics is house histories. And it's the first category we ever dove into. And obviously, we didn't get anywhere near to finishing that category, that house, all house histories. Please, that would, ooh, that's a lot, of, a lot of episodes. But we're getting back to our roots with some new blood. 
And our subject house for today knows quite a few things about roots and blood as a house in the north, but it's their more recent history, not their ancient history. They had to uproot, and instead of marriages within the reach, their bloodlines married into the north. But it would be wrong to say that they are new to the north. Maybe in relative terms they are, but they've been there for a thousand years or so. By the way, a thousand years ago. You're going to hear that phrase a lot this episode. That's a big part of why this episode sprawled into two, by the way. We found a lot of things that happened a thousand years ago, but we also realized that this house basically has two different distinct histories. They have a southern history and a northern history, and each of those histories requires context that... Most of us aren't that familiar with. Heck, I wasn't that familiar with it until we really dove into it. So I'm pretty sure that this is going to be very new to a lot of you. So as it stands currently, House Mandalorians are the rulers of White Harbor. And they're a family that's actually only mentioned a grand total of 46 times in the first three books, which really isn't that many. For reference, House Craig Hall, which most of you maybe only know by name. You've heard the name, and you're like, wait, House Craig Hall? Yeah, I know that name, but... Well, they've, they're mentioned 20 times in the first three books, so about half, but they're not even close to half as important as the Mandalays, right? Well, that's true, but the way it plays out, it's the North descends into further chaos and they dance with dragons, and that's when the Mandalays become really key figures in the plot. But we also discover through those plots that they've actually been doing quite a lot before that. Even though they didn't have a lot of mentions in the first few books, they were doing a lot off screen. That's a big part of what we're going to cover. Although a lot of that will be in part two. Looking back, those 46 mentions are perhaps fittingly seen as seeds that grow into more important plot points later. Given George R. R. Martin's gardener style, that fits pretty well. Seeds are always a good analogy. George added even more seeds to the mix by putting quite a bit of them in the world of ice and fire, as well as quite a lot more on the two regions they're from. One of the reasons we chose the quote we did for this opener is that, like most houses, the Mandalorians have, like, a flag-bearer figure. It's a good term to use here. A character that's more central than the rest of the house. Kind of, They're kind of like the featured member of the house. And it's kind of like the one you think of first when you think of that house. You know, with the Starks, you don't necessarily think of one person. You think of a lot of people. Same with the Lannisters, because they're so central. But with a house like the Manderleys, you almost everyone's just going to think of Wyman first. In most cases, this figure is usually the house's leader. It's not always the case, but usually. And this is certainly the case here uh, with Lord Wyman. As Stannis mockingly nicknamed him Lord Too Fat to Sit a Horse, you know, he's a gargantuan figure, literally. But also figuratively. He who has settled himself into many discussions since Dance of Dragons was released. Because not only is he a man of hidden secrets, grand plans, and... Damn good speeches, really. <laughs> He's ambitious, cunning, and a master game player. And most of this we did not see coming. Much like many of his ancestors and even current family, they have these same traits. And I love to point out that just as Lord Wyman is becoming big... No, no, no pun intended that time. No, no, really. You don't, you don't believe me, though, do you? <laughs> I just don't have any credibility when I say I didn't intend to pun. Oh, well. I'll say it differently. Just as Lord Wyman, the character... And House Manderley, the house, become big. In the book, A Dance with Dragons, House Manderley itself became big during the historical war, the Dance of the Dragons. Right? I hope that made sense. <laughs> Even then, the Manderleys were big, literally this time. Ambitious and loyal, though. Not to mention rich and powerful, like they also are now. And that was true before they were in the North, too. Heck, it's part of what got them booted from the South in the first place, being too powerful and too rich. Of course, beyond Wyman and his ancestors, we have his immediate family who are far more critical than they first appear, critical to the series and perhaps to the future of the series. But as always, we prefer to do things chronologically as much as possible. That means trying to fish out or merling out their beginning. Let's do that. Origins. Unlike many of the well-known houses of Westeros, we don't have a founding story for House Manderley. We don't know if they originated in the Age of Heroes or sometime after, though they probably did. They definitely existed during the time of the Kingdom of the Reach before the Andals. But before that, eh, we just don't know. Despite that, we have a lot here. They're famous for being a house in the north that worships the gods in the south, of course. 
But apparently they did worship the old gods initially because, well, they existed before the Andals came. And before the Andals came, no one worshipped the Seven in Westeros that we know of. So it's kind of like, you know, they flipped twice in a sense. A theme among the ancient houses of the Reach is tracing their descent to the mythical Garth the Gardener. But we, of course, we don't know how the Manderleys fit into that. I favor a theory that they descend from John the Oak, one of Garth's sons and founder of House Oakheart. Now, why I favor that theory isn't going to make a lot of sense until I lay out a, several other things. So let's do that. These are fun things, too. What's in a name? Well, in Westeros, and the real world, often a great deal. In this case, even more than that. Our more geographically astute watchers might have already realized that Manderly sounds a great deal like Mander, which just so happens to be a mighty river in the Reach. The mightiest, in fact. And when you know it, that is where the Manderleys originate. The family, unsurprisingly, have always maintained that the river takes its name from the family, not the reverse, though we don't actually know which is true. Linguistically, the, the L-Y suffix normally denotes of, so that way it kind of indicates the river came first. But it may imply they were there really early on. Either way, we're not sure. Looking at a map, the Mander is a long waterway that stretches from Tumbleton in the northeast of the Reach all the way down past High Garden and entering out near the Shield Islands. And it absorbs the Blueburn and the Cockleswent rivers along the way. Rivers, of course, are a cornerstone of human civilization, given that life depends on fresh water, it's prime real estate. And that's true for the real world as much as it is for Westeros. And especially the lower tech you are. You know, the less technology you have, the more you have to be like right there by the source. There's no piping, you know, there's not, they don't have aqueducts in Westeros. You don't have, you know, the technology to transport meaningful quantities to support a population. That's just how it is. It's why pretty much almost all the ancient houses and all the cities, including real world cities, not all the real world cities, but all the ancient ones, and quite a few castles as well, were built right along rivers, or at least by other bodies of water, like lakes. As well as on coast, but of course that's not fresh water. Being the longest and broadest, though not the deepest, river in Westeros means that more than one settlement, lots of settlements, many houses that is, are going to be along the Mander as well, and that they found their origins there too. They've, they've, the houses were founded there. High Garden resides on a hill by its banks. Houses Fossaway, Merriweather, Caswell, and Footley all seem to claim similar genesis along these waters. The Manderleys did so at a castle named Dunstanbury. Before Highgarden established itself as a dominant power in the Reach, back when Westeros was made up of petty kingdoms, hundred kingdoms period, you know, we kind of loosely call it. House Manderley may have been around back then, they may have been independent, though we don't hear them being kings. Still, they likely warred frequently with their neighbors, most likely the ones closest by, right? That just makes common sense. Perhaps some of the ones we just named, in fact. And this is where our first interesting mystery comes up, though. We don't know who their closest neighbors were. Apart from apparently being on or near the river, the location of Dunstanbury hasn't been revealed. As you just saw, the Mander is large, so it's not exactly something we can just narrow down by process of elimination that way. It seems like there's a lot of possibilities, right? Actually, no. I don't think so. I think there's only one solid possibility. To contradict myself by saying there's a lot, I don't. I think there's only one. Let me break that down for you. And there's a lot of evidence for it and not much evidence for anything else, which is part of why I think there's only one option. So we're going to go deeper into the Mander itself. Yeah, okay, pun intended. With the exception of nasty rivers or nasty parts of rivers, there's often more than just fresh water to providing value there. Literally, in this case, water means access to trade. The Mander is, however, a slow-moving river. That probably makes it safer, but less efficient for trade. But still good for trade. That effect is worsened because apparently there's a lot of sandbars and snags and such, but those are just obstacles. They're not truly dangerous. They're not going to wreck a ship. And, you know, bottom line, is still a lot better than land travel. It's so much cheaper. You don't have to feed your pack animals. Yeah, just way easier. Around High Garden, it's even better. The Mander... It's smoother, clearer, a little wider, not as many sandbars, etc. Until it empties out into the Sunset Sea, and then it's a sea. <laughs> if we look around the largest rivers of Westeros and Essos, 
And again, the real world, you see a trend. The mouth, meaning the area where the river meets the sea, is very often a very choice spot for trade. For smaller rivers, rivers with little to, little trade or rivers with extreme conditions, this is less true. But the Mander is none of those things. It's very large. It's great for trading, even though it's a little slow. But bottom line, it's great for trade. And so let's look at a few other places real quick. The Blackwater Rush was fought over for eons by a lot of different kings and houses. But when a strong king finally took over, Aegon the Conqueror himself, that is, he built King's Landing, where the river meets Blackwater Bay, and only 300 years later, it's the largest city in Westeros. Well, actually, it didn't even take 300 years to do that. But here we are. The spot where the Mandalees are now is White Harbor. And before that, it was the Wolf's Den, which we'll talk about more later. But this is the mouth of the White Knife, which empties into the Bite. And we know the Mandalees are rich from trade. And that we know they were rich from trade then. The Roin, huge Volantis controlling its mouth. And they are the largest of the free cities. Largest of them all by far of the ones I've named is the great and mysterious Ashai. Well, that's quite possibly the largest there is, period. Ashai sits where the Ash River empties into the Jade Sea. Even Ashai is by a river. And smaller than any of the ones I just listed, the planky town of Dorne rests at the mouth of the green blood. And I'm not cherry picking here. Take a look at the map yourself. Try to find examples of rivers without something at the mouth. You'll find a few, but you won't find it at big rivers. And the nearest of all to all this is Old Town. We know well how powerful and wealthy the High Towers are and how long they've been so, and we know why. So yes, if you're following along with my line of thinking here, we're led to this big question. Why is there nothing at the mouth of the Mander? There's no castle or city or anything there that we know of. So my suggestion is that's where Dunstanbury is. But I need a lot more proof than, it's a great spot for trade and someone should be there. Yeah, I need more proof than that. That is not enough. Plus, there's some counter evidence. If we're being fair, we're going to lay it out all on the table here. The proximity to Old Town is a good example of potential counter evidence here. It maybe blocks out the sun, so to speak. As in, it's such a big trading center that maybe there's not a lot of opportunities in the general vicinity because everything flows through Old Town. And not too far to the north of the Mander is Landsport. Similarly large and powerful. Maybe these towns don't want a trading competitor. And maybe High Garden didn't want someone cutting off the choice trade by being, you know, close to the, the sea while they're upriver and thus kind of cut off. But worst of all, it isn't these competing trading centers necessarily, it's the Ironborn. Back then, the Ironborn were really a bigger threat. They ravaged the coasts and the rivers. They sailed up the Mander with impunity. It was bad. And this had to stifle trade and more, like population growth and just people being happy. Old Town and Lannisport were simply stronger and less vulnerable than any lesser ports. So generally, raiders would aim for the easier pickings. Most of them couldn't take on such a large target like Old Town. Now... So these counter evidence bits here, none of these can be ignored, nor will we ignore them. The proximity of Old Town thing, though, is dubious. I don't know that that matters. There's trading all around Old Town even now. There's trading at the Arbor. There's trading in these smaller towns. There's trading on the Shield Islands. I mean, there's trading everywhere. So I just don't think that this blocking out the sun thing is going to st stifle trade too much in other places. The, the, uh, the Mander is just so large, too. There's so many castles and sediments along it that they would be trading up and down the river. And that wouldn't have much to do with Old Town. And, of course, High Garden. What about them stopping trade? Between, you know, being the ones who try to take it over and not allow someone farther down river to, to do the best they can. Well, High Garden may not have been powerful enough back then to just stop another house from doing what they wanted to. That took time. High Garden eventually dominated the area. But we can't assume that they just, from the get-go had that on lockdown. So that leaves the Ironborn. Well, you know I love talking about the Ironborn, but they had gone as far as taking the Misty Islands, which at the time were mostly populated with fisher folk, and those aren't so equipped to stop them. The Misty Islands are now called the Shield Islands, so that shows you how close they were. The Shield Islands, look at this. This is a frighteningly close base to the rest of the Reach. I mean, they're right there. Their raids were stopped cold, though, when the shields were taken 
from the Iron Man by King Garth the Seventh Gardener. He appointed one new lord to rule each of the four islands and renamed them the Shield Islands, or the Four Shields. The world of ice and fire. Thereafter, he resettled the islands with his fiercest fighters, granting them special dispensations for the purpose of turning them into a first defense against the Ironborn, should they return. This proved a great success, and to this day the men of the Four Shields pride themselves on defending the mouth of the Mander and the heart of the Reach against any and all seaborne foes. They also installed a system of beacon fires that could be lit when longships were sighted, and this would give major advance warnings to the inland communities and all the surrounding communities that the Ironborn were coming. A great early warning system that didn't exist before. This is basically a whole new community, the Shield Islands, dedicated to fighting the Ironborn, kind of like what you see at Seaguard. And this would have dramatically improved nearby trade. Everyone would have felt safer to start doing their thing, to start making money, to start connecting with each other. Communities could develop more. So it's probably a huge leap, not just economically, but just for humans in general. Everything would have been better. With the Shields guarding the Mander so effectively, it was surely King Garth's wish that the Ironborn would be kept out forever. You know, this, they wanted to keep this a permanent situation. 2,000 years later, Euron Greyjoy undid that. But, you know, like 2,000 years is a pretty good length of time to hold on to something. And, of course, Euron's probably going to lose them because he doesn't really want to hold on to them. And the Reach will reclaim the shields again. And they feel this is righteous. It is, they think it's theirs. They think the Shield Islands belong to them. After all, they've held the Shield Islands since the time of Owen Oakenshield, who dates to the... Age of Heroes. A long time ago, right? But Owen Oakenshield, well, he didn't simply sail to the islands and establish himself. No, it was not that simple. The islands were already held. Even before they were the Misty Islands, they had other denizens who were driven away by the first men. And no, I speak not of the children of the forest who live in the deep forests and caves. Not so much on islands. I speak instead of a race that lives deep in the sea. What's in a sigil? Art by the Eagle of Seaguard. As we said at the beginning, House Manderly doesn't have house words, but they do have a famous merman sigil. Very often animal sigils indicate a connection to the ancient past, right? We, we've been through that before. Starks really do have a connection to dire wolves. And in the West, home of the Lannisters, there really used to be great lions, and they still have regular lions. Like the one that famously took the leg of the Clegane's grandfather. It's not always a reflection of history or truth, though. For example, I don't think the Conningtons have a connection to real griffins at any point in their history, although it's possible. The Mandalays and Mermen could be said to fall in that category as Merlings are mythical, right? Well, as to that, it's a topic all on its own, but I would guess they were real at one point and probably still are. What would kill them off living down there where they do? And humans aren't going to. How could land beings ever wipe out a race down there? Right? That's... <laughs> it's just hard to imagine how they would die out. Now, maybe they fight each other. Maybe there's multiple races down there fighting each other and one destroyed the other. But that would still leave one left. Apparently, these undersea races can come on land sometimes and maybe that's when the humans can catch them. And if legends are true, some used to live on land at least semi-regularly. We're told here in the World of Ice and Fire that the Shield Islands had to be conquered back in the Age of Heroes, that the Selkies and Merlings were driven back into the sea. Hmm, that's really cool. But the presence of Merlings and or Deep Ones, which may be the same thing, though if not, then well, there's, there's one of your possible reasons for extinction that I just mentioned. One undersea race wiping out another could happen, right? But the Iron Islands are not so far away. Not for raiders, anyway. Merling legends exist around Old Town as well, and in the Iron Islands, and Lannisport, and Blackwater Bay. Davos survived by being washed up on the spears of the Merling King. Those are rock, just the name for those rocks. Sailors still pay homage to the Merling King in port temples around the world. It's like a god people worship, or at least a god that they fear. <laughs> House Upcliff of Witch Isle, not a very well-known house, in, but this is in the Vale, and it's a little tiny island off the coast of the Fingers there. Very uh, dark and sorcerous place, apparently. This uh, member, this lady there, called herself the Bride of the Merlin King at one point. 
Artis Aaron himself had Merlings as friends, apparently. Okay. And in the Shivering Sea, we hear Merlings are darker skinned and more dangerous. It may have been these northern Merlings who wiped out the ancient maze makers of Lorath, as we're told. That's a whole other subject. Now, two points out of all this first that I think I really want to draw your attention to. First, the fact that there's so many examples of Merlings, lots of stories from a lot of different places. Second, given so many examples, the patterns are more meaningful because it's a larger sample size. We have more data to look at. I just rattled off basically every place in the known world known to have Merling or Deep One legends. And there's a pattern. All of these places, every single one of these sightings are ocean or sea based. Salt water, not fresh. As far as we know, there is no such thing as a freshwater merling. There are no freshwater merling legends, which means there are no river merlings. So if the Manderleys are anywhere else along the Mander River other than the mouth, it doesn't really make sense, meaning their sigil. Why would you have this sea creature as your sigil when you live on a river where this sea creature doesn't exist? It's kind of weird. But it, it's not weird at all if they're on the coast right by the river and the sea at the same time. It would be baffling to choose a sigil so alien to their nature and origin, completely unsupported by local legend. It would be like a Dornish house deep in the Red Mountains choosing a Kraken sigil, <laughs> or a house deep in the Wolf's Wood choosing a lemon. <laughs> when I put all this together, you can see why I feel very confident about that Dunstanbury was near the mouth of the Mander. It fits so well, and other things don't. So we've kind of come back full circle here again to who their ancient neighbors were. There's these houses along the mouth of the Mander, but we should also probably consider that Merlings were their neighbors back in the really early days as well. So one of those houses in particular that would be in this area, if the Manderleys were in this area, is House Oakheart. Note how close Old Oak is to both the mouth of the Mander and the Shield Islands. So here's a fun little add-on theory to the Dunstanbury idea. But hey, these little add-on theories, some of these are the most fun kind of all. So this involves us completing another circle. We have House Oakhart, and their founder was who I mentioned before, John the Oak. And I figured there's a good chance that there's a connection between House Oakhart and our friend Owen Oakenshield. It's not certain because the term oak, this and that, comes up a lot in the ancient reach. They had a, their throne was the Oaken seat, for example. But really, everyone in this area, all these famous ancient houses in the Reach, claim descent from Garth Greenhand. So, anyway, Owen Oakenshield is whom one of the Shield Islands is named after. There's Green Shield, South Shield, Gray Shield, and Owen. No, no, okay, it's not named Owen, it's called Oakenshield. And it sits fairly close to the Mander, being the easternmost of the Shields. Nowadays, it's held by Newt the Barber of the Ironborn, but for 2,000 years before him, it was House Hewitt. You'll recall House Hewitt from a particular Victorian chapter, the scene where they're celebrating their victory over the Shield Islands. It's pretty gross. It's disturbing. Euron is forcing the girls of House Hewitt to serve them. And it's the brutality of the scene and the larger plot points that are going on. There's a lot happening in that scene. Kind of overshadow the fact that there's a lot of history in this moment. Ironborn versus Shield Islanders is a very old rivalry. And if you believe, as I do, that the Ironborn have the blood of the Deep Ones and or the Merlings deep in their background, then taking into account the legend that the Merlings held the shields before humankind, then there's some sort of really ancient history in that moment. It's like the blood of the Deep reclaiming the shield through their Ironborn brethren. Which means, maybe we should ask what else is in a sigil. In truly ancient times, quite a few houses' animal connections come in the form of skin changer bonds. And this is assumed to be big in the north, but remember back in the day, skin changing, the children of the forest, worship of the old gods was all of Westeros. We've talked about Merlings, but we haven't talked about the Selkies who got a brief mention in that uh, ancient history of the Shield Islands, because they were driven out also, as we saw. Selkies are a Scottish legend. They're a seal in water, a human on land. You can see how that is kind of close to skin changing in a loose sense, and how that sort of relates to, to Merlings, especially this, the idea of Merlings being on land. Now here's where I remind you all of House Farwind, where the connection is even tighter. 
the world of ice and fire. A secondary island grouping lies eight days' sail to the northwest in the Sunset Sea. There, seals and sea lions make their rookeries on windswept rocks too small to support even a single household. On the largest rock stands the keep of House Farwind, named the Lonely Light for the beacon that blazes atop its roof day and night. Queer things are said of the far winds and the small folk they rule. Some say they lie with seals to bring forth half-human children, whilst others whisper that they are skin changers who can take the forms of sea lions, walrus, even spotted whales, the wolves of the western seas. Aaron Greyjoy speaks of them in almost the exact same way. How about that? The maesters and a zealous drowned priest agreeing on something. Now, House Farwin isn't exactly close to the mouth of the Mander, but proximity isn't really the point. It's the, it's the fact that these kind of legends exist at all. Particularly the idea of human, hybrid, animal, creature type things. There's lots of different stories around that. And uh, after all, that's pretty blatantly what a merman looks like, <laughs> right? Just physically. It's like kind of like a centaur, but in the water. Instead of a horse, you know, bottom half, you have a fish bottom half. It could easily be seen as an artistic ar interpretation of a skin changer, like this whole concept of the human half representing the bond, who's in control, the brain is the human, uh, the body is the animal. But it doesn't have to be an interpretation when it might very well be real. Merlin legends appear all over the world, as we saw, in many cultures and places, and we likewise have no shortage of skin changer examples and, and flat out proof. Heck, we have POVs showing us. And then, so we take that in mind, maybe the Manderleys have some strange skin changer blood creepiness of their own that's maybe similar to what House Farwind had going on here. Uh, I mean, the Starks have that in their background, and the Ironborn doing theirs. This is really. Not a stretch at all, given how common this seems to be. So how about that for House Manderley? It would be extra cool because, you know, they're back in the north now. So it's like, it's like homecoming, sort of. You know, they're, they, you thought they were north-south hybrids from a cultural standpoint, but this is a different kind of hybrid, right? It's all really cool. I also kind of wonder, thinking of the Ironborn, you know, back then when they were able to rampage all over like they wanted to before the Shield Islands were you know, fortified, there had to be some Mandalays carried off as salt wives by the Ironborn over the centuries, if not more. And you can wonder, did any ever make their way back home? Some of them may have had children. Remember that in the Iron Islands, thralls are born free. You can be taken as a thrall, but your children are not thralls. So imagine a scenario where you have a Manderly woman captured, you know, forced to marry, has kids, those kids are born free. Maybe some of them are... Get to go back to the Reach or something. You know, if I was if I was that kid, I would go to Lord Manderley and say, my Manderley blood is stronger than my Ironborn blood. You know, and you'd have to get him to admit that if he didn't agree with you, then he would be admitting that the Ironborn are stronger than House Manderley. So that would be a good kind of way to get in their good graces. <laughs> so if you saw these connections coming, you do deserve a tough cookie for that one. I think we surprised a lot of people there. I was surprised by digging this up. So to this, we're going to add that there's also multiple Stark marriages in their past that we know of, and almost certainly more that we do not know of. So there's just so much interesting bloodline mixing here. But still, despite all that, there's no direct evidence for any of this manifesting into something we can point to. We don't have actual Manderly skin changer stories or Manderly stories related to any of this stuff. But it is nice to know they aren't just boring and all blooded. <laughs> Those folk almost never have anything cool, magical stuff going on. They have the most boring blood and the most boring gods, I tell you. <laughs> Similarly, any ancient connection between the Ironborn and or Merlings and Deep Ones or what have you, and the Manderleys, might linger in bloodlines somehow. But that would be thin, I suppose, since they aren't marrying around the same region they used to. Geographically, they are very far apart these days. But, as I'll explain later... These traits linger, and the stuff that happens early in the day, like early in these houses' existence, still exists now. So thin blood, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't linger. More on that later. Davos is famously told that they are not troubled by Ironborn on their side of Westeros, right? But for most of their history, back before they moved north, they did suffer for them quite a lot. It's like, well, we're not suffering from the Ironborn now, but before we moved to White Harbor, oh boy, that was a big problem. And especially if my theory about them being at the mouth of the Mander is, is accurate. But 
even if it's not, it would be true because we saw that the Ironborn had that kind of reach. Because <sighs> they could go all the way up river, they could, their longships allow them to have a shallow draft, they can pillage and raid all along the Mander. So, anyway, that was, the, that was the point of fortifying the Shield Islands, though, to keep that from happening anymore. No more upriver raids either. So once the Ironborn threat was kept in check, again, that means trade and everything can develop more, people can safely live there, more prosperity, etc. But prosperity can create its own new set of conflicts. Not bloody in this case, not as bloody, but very important in shaping Westerosi history, perhaps more important. Here we get to use House Hewitt of Oakenshield again as an example, because they run, or rather ran, a large and successful port town called Lord Hewitt's Town, which could easily date back to the founding of the island by the Reachmen. So this is thousands of years ago and may have been a trade rival with the ports on the Mander, especially anyone trading at the mouth of the Mander so close by. This is a reminder that not all wars are fought with swords and spears or tridents in the Manderly case. Trade wars are a thing too. And though sometimes they can devolve into real worlds, they don't always. And even if there was nothing like a trade war in this case, the wealth of House Manderley was really significant. And it's easy to see how that would be perceived as threatening to established but less wealthy houses, right? You don't, uh, big houses don't like anything coming along threatening them. So we're going to look at that because it's quite possibly what got them kicked out of the South in the first place. Mer money, mer problems. Dance with dragons, Davos won. The Manderleys are no Northmen, not down deep. Twas no more than 900 years ago when they came north, laden down with all their gold and gods. They'd been great lords on the Mander until they overreached themselves and the Green Hands slapped them down. The Wolf King took their gold, but he gave them land and let them keep their gods. So House Manderley is rich now, and they were rich when they got to the north, meaning they were rich before they left the south. That wealth was part of what got them in with the Wolf King, as that quote says. It also says the Green Hands, meaning the Gardener Kings, whose sigil was a green hand, slapped them down. Well, we don't know what it means that they, quote, overreached themselves, but it's a safe bet that means something in the range of, say, at a minimum, threatening the power of the Kings of the Reach, or maximum, making an outright play to take the crown of the Reach. I don't have strong feelings where the truth falls within that range, but I do have strong feelings on why the Mandalays were powerful enough to be in such a position in the first place. Money. That's the theme with them. They may not have aspired to be kings, but they sure do eat like kings. <laughs> their wealth is on display. Their court is ostentatious. I mean, it's beautiful, but it's not exactly understated. It's, it's kind of gaudy. So as you hear this description, be aware that the World of Ice and Fire tells us that the Manderleys were aiming to make their castle in the north like the one they lost, Dunstanbury. A Dance with Dragons, Davos III. As many times as he had visited White Harbor, Davos had never set foot inside the new castle, much less the merman's court. Its walls and floor and ceiling were made of wooden planks notched cunningly together and decorated with all the creatures of the sea. As they approached the dais, Davos trod on painted crabs and clams and starfish, half hidden amongst twisting black fronds of seaweed and the bones of drowned sailors. On the walls to either side, pale sharks prowled painted blue-green depths, whilst eels and octopods slithered amongst rocks and sunken ships. Shoals of herring and great codfish swam between the tall arched windows. Higher up, near where the old fishing nets drooped down from the rafters, the surface of the sea had been depicted. To his right, a war galley stroked serene against the rising sun. To his left, a battered old cog raced before a storm, her sails in rags. Behind the dais, a kraken and grey leviathan were locked in battle beneath the painted waves. In addition to this implication of wealth, it's very significant wealth, we have even more implied evidence that the Manderleys were at the mouth of the Mander. It's an aquatic scene, but it is decidedly sea-slash-ocean stuff. There's no river imagery at all in there. To be fair, there are freshwater eels and freshwater seaweed, but there are no freshwater octopi nor squid, and we have that scene with a kraken fighting a gray leviathan. A gray leviathan also isn't going to be going in any rivers. <laughs> Excuse me, by the way, because I forgot what I was saying, because all that is just really too badass. Kraken fighting a gray leviathan, man. Think about that for a minute. Anyway, 
we were talking about wealth and how the Manderleys had a lot of it. So I will reiterate that their displays of, not to mention actual proof of, wealth make way more sense if they were in a uh, money-making spot, which were confined to the Mander in this case, and is not far up river. Really far up river is not the money-making spots. It's not where the big bucks are most of the time. The money is there at the mouth, where you get the confluence of river and sea trade. Ocean-going vessels don't go up river, and river vessels don't go out into the sea. You know, with the exception of ironborne longships. Lord Wyman tells Davos in Dance with Dragons that he lacks sailors, despite all his rivermen, which illustrates yet another difference between the two mediums. But to the point, being at the end point of where both river and seagoing vessels can reach creates a ton of opportunity to get fat and rich like the Manderleys have. Not only can wealth threaten your neighbors in a setting like this, but it can also inspire greed. However, whichever is true, it's usually the former that gets cited. Meaning, usually people play scared to justify taking things away from others, rather than just admitting that they want to take it. Only someone like King Aegon the Unworthy is that shameless, save the insane ones like Magor and Ares who didn't seem to need to justify anything. They just did it and the consequences were what they were. Who knows what all the characters in the Reach were like at this time. Maybe Lord Manderley was unjustly accused. Yeah, probably not, but it's, it's possible. One of the aforementioned Reach families were the Peaks, a family who not only came from the first men, like the Manderleys did, but also reportedly from Floris the Fox and her father, Garth Greenhand. Historically, and for reasons unknown, the Peaks and the Manderleys did not get on, though I suspect they were neighbors, which would explain a lot of this enmity. But we also don't know where their castle of Starpike is. Anyway, it seems they were forever bickering and scrapping. You can see some connection to the Blackwoods and House Bracken here, but those two got those two are still together, whereas these two were separated. At some point, the fighting became so bad that the King of the Reach, a gardener named King Gwain the Fat, was forced to intervene and just told both families, hey, knock it off, settle down. Somehow he managed to do this without bloodshed, which I guess that's amazing. And it did persuade the two factions to choose a more traditional route. You know, politicking, courtly stuff, schmoozing, befriending, marrying off daughters, that sort of typical scenario we see quite a lot. And both sides were good at this, apparently. Uh, by the time King Garth Gardner X rolled around, each respective lord had managed to marry one of the king's daughters. That means Manderley and Peak. But in this case, when Garth died, he didn't have any male heirs, and the way these cultures worked then, and still to some degree work now, that often means big problems, like civil war or the equivalent. In this conflict, well, it began with betrayal, gossip, and murder, all those good things that we're used to, before the pretense just all fell away and they just went into open warfare. This time the scale was much larger, with other lords being drawn in, and apparently no peace was reached for over a decade. That is a long time to go to war. That's like Trojan War length, right? <laughs> Eventually, Highgarden intervened again, though this time it was a Tyrell. As you will remember, before the conquest, the Tyrells were stewards to the gardeners, and Sir Osmond Tyrell was one such high steward. Gathering lords from all over the reach, Osmond defeated Lord Peak and Manderley, then finally sorted the matter by ascension by placing a young King Mern VI gardener on the throne, who was a distant cousin of the recently deceased Garth X. With near countless examples, we know that these proud houses don't forget slights or arguments particularly quickly. That would be selling it short, really. They will keep old rivalries and quarrels alive for centuries for whatever reason, and that's exactly what happened with the Peaks and Manderleys. By all accounts, the Manderleys may have sealed their own fate by doing exactly what most powerful families try and do, which is to become even more powerful. Of course, they do this by playing the Game of Thrones, particularly those who are ambitious. And as you'll see with Wyman and some of his relatives, the Manderleys have had a very fair share, more than their fair share, of ambitious lords. And we will go through what we know about that over the course of this episode. Often, gluttony is used as a literary device to indicate greed, and that might be in play here. In fact, I think it definitely is. Uh, houses with talent or long experience of playing the Game of Thrones can smell ambition 
and it's a familiar smell because they usually have it themselves. They also know to see it as a threat and an opportunity because whenever a house loses power, some other house or houses gains it. They fill that vacuum. They're ready to do that. They're ready to pick it up, grab that power, and run with it. In this case, the gardeners at the time were still kings of the reach, became wary of House Manderley and their growing power, and decided to nip the problem in the bud before it was too late. Rather than be seen as worried about, you know, this or that house, King Percy and the third gardener enlisted Lord Lorimar Peake to drive the Manderleys out, inflaming their old rivalry as a reason once again. While it's fair and reasonable to assume that there was a large amount of violence involved, we don't actually have any details on how this war went or the actual mechanisms of the ousting, only that the Manderleys were driven from Dunstanbury, which the Peaks got to keep, by the way, and left with no friends, connections, or home. But they did keep their money, at least a lot of it, with them. So clearly the Manderleys themselves were not fully nipped in their collective buds. In this case, Cersei was wrong. They played the Game of Thrones and didn't win, but they also didn't die. <laughs> the story and circumstances are vague, but there are a lot of specific names involved. Let's take a quick aside for Dunstanbury. We got a few other details here. Very few peaks turn up in A Song of Ice and Fire, so we rarely get a chance to peak them. Ugh. That's partly, well, largely because they were very powerful, but by the time A Song of Ice and Fire rolls around, they're not. They could also be said to have overreached more than once, and that finds them where they are today. We get a much better look in the tales of Duncan Egg, specifically the Mystery Knight, when Duncan Egg meets Lord Gorman Peak on his way to White Walls. The Mystery Knight. A third lord followed more sedately at the head of a long column. There were two dozen in the party, grooms and cooks and serving men, all to attend three knights, plus men-at-arms and mounted crossbowmen, and a dozen drays heavy laden with their armor, tents, and provisions. Slung from the lord's saddle was his shield, dark orange and charged with three black castles. Dunk knew those arms, but from where? The lord who bore them was an older man, sour-mouthed and saturnine, with a close-cropped salt-and-pepper beard. This particular peak... Also an ambitious man, playing a major role in the plot to put Damon the Second Blackfire on the throne, thus returning the Blackfires to some semblance of power. Well, th the top spot, if they had their way. Duncan Egg Tales have a major strength in displaying the regrets and pains of supporting different sides of the rebellions. It's a big theme that uh, isn't the whole thing with Duncan Egg, but it's a big part of it. By this time, the Peaks had already suffered at the hands of the Targaryens. Meaning, at the time of the Mystery Night, they had already failed in the first Blackfire Rebellion, and their punishment was losing two castles. Well, one of those two castles was Dunstanbury. <laughs> Despite Gorman Peak being a renowned knight at the time, his family only owns Starpike. By the time he meets Duncan Egg, it's something that really bothers him. <laughs> Until he's killed, in which case, nothing bothers him anymore. So what, what happened to these forfeited castles? We don't know... But, you know, we have a few guesses. In both the case of White Grove, which is the unnamed third castle, and Starpike, which is still the Peak's home, and Dunstanbury, which they also lost in the first Blackfire Rebellion, we don't know where any of these castles are. Nor do we know who the Targaryens give, gave them to after, you know, divvying up the spoils and stripping them from the Peaks. We don't even know if they still exist. There is a chance they don't. Fitting in with my... Various theories about why and how House Manderley got the boot and what made them powerful would be a very wary high guard. If a power downriver emerged to challenge them, it's easy to see them not allowing that to happen again. Reduce the power of Dunstanbury so its new owner can never rise like House Manderley did. The way it works a lot of times is they have these town charters. The reason there aren't more cities in Westeros is because they have to be given permission to expand. They're not allowed to just grow as much as they want. That's a matter of up to the king or the nobles. And what we might be seeing here is that once House Manderley did their thing, Highgarden took steps to make sure that no one ever followed that same path. It's kind of like what happened with Harrenhal. Harrenhal used to be really powerful because it controlled the surrounding countryside. It was actually able to supply itself. Nowadays, Heron Hall is reduced because it doesn't control the land around it, not much of it, so it can't support itself, so it's kind of perpetually poor. But it doesn't have to be that way. 
Anyway, this is a way for kings and nobles to reduce the power of people around them without taking their castle away. So, in this case, we might be looking at exactly what happened. The idea that Dunsonbury and Whitegrove are fairly weak now might explain why we don't hear about them anymore. That would make a lot of sense. This all fits really well. But, again, we're not sure. Normally, it's too much power to let a, a house have three castles, so it's kind of interesting that House Peak ever had that, especially in light of the Manderleys being too powerful, right? <laughs> High Garden gets the Peaks to drive out the Manderleys because the Manderleys are too powerful, but then rewards House Peak with these castles, seemingly making them too powerful. Well, I can't claim that these kings of the Reach were smart. I also can't claim to know everything that was happening. What we do have, though, is the knowledge that when the Manderleys made it north, they eventually made their new home in the image of the old one, and they did escape. They got away. And this all helps us understand their past. So let's travel north with them now. It's time to head there. There's a castle Dunstanburr in Northumberland. That's the northern part of England, just south of Scotland. Even better, it rests near a village called Craster. The castle's mailing address includes the name Craster. No kidding. It was built by Earl Thomas of Lancaster during the time of King Edward II, circa 1313. He, like the Manderleys, overreached his authority, actually having the king's close friend and rumored lover, Piers Gaveston, murdered. Now, if you've seen Braveheart, you'll recall seeing Piers Gaveston killed by someone else, thrown out the window by King Edward I, while Prince Edward, the future Edward II, looked on in horror. Earl Thomas built Dunstanburr to be fancy, not unlike House Manderley's Dunstanbury. While House Manderley survived their failed rebellion, Earl Thomas did not. Thanks to Jojo Dixon 76 aka Lady Dane on Twitter for that one. She has visited the castle herself and says her grandfather lived in the area. Very cool. Let me say hey to Sir Terence, Knight of the Cedars. Let me give a big shout out to our blood riders, Kohal Koei, Master of the Bow, called Sun Piercer, who has recently slain Lady Mother-in-Law of House Bitch for cutting off both of her son's hair without permission. Like, wow. Also, Vorsaki, wielder of a Valyrian steel arak with a dragon bone hilt. Thanks to our sellsword captains. With these folks on their side, House Manderley might never have left the south. Peter Blaze of the Emerald Isle, captain of the Werewood Wanderers, to long lives, quick deaths, cold beer, and warm women. Dagron, marshal of the axe, captain of the Red Tide. Resistance is futile. Chiron Callsbane, captain of the Stone Shields. The torrent breaks upon the stone. Hema Helminth, captain of the Whispering Children. Dead men tell no secrets. Lady Lajara Dajo, the Iron Lily, Master Archer, Castellan of the Summer Island Keep, Arboreal Point, captain of the all-female Wailing Widows, women and children first. Cody the Crimson, Bastard of Bracken, captain of the Red Waste Exiles and recruiter of the Free Folk. Cameron the Hammer of Hornwood, captain of the English Lions, with the motto, Honor is the Reward of Virtue. Lord Brandon Brewer of Castle Blackrune, captain of the Shadow Wolves. Our steel is cold, our vengeance colder. The North, we members? Yes, House Manderley, the North seems to have accepted you. You are members. We hear people mock Lord Wyman's weight, a few call him coward, but I don't know of any common negative attitudes in the North towards them. They seem to be at home now, despite their quirks and obvious cultural differences. They've made it work. Let's look at how and why. We aren't gifted with an even semi-specific date for the arrival of the Manderleys in the North. In The Sworn Sword, Lady Rohan Weber claims that the Manderleys left a thousand years ago. Well, she said it in a more feminine voice, probably, but, you know. And this was the year 211 AC. Lord Godric Borel essentially agrees with that estimation when he says that it was no more than 900 years ago, but he's speaking 100 years later, around 300. So having said that, there are some more reliable sources. Will Amanderly and the world of Vice and Fire seem to agree that it was a thousand years before the conquest itself? And that phrase, a thousand years ago, again, it comes up so often, and again, don't take it literally. It shouldn't be taken literally, but it definitely gives us some context. So the best summer we can get, putting all that together, is that Somewhere between 1,000 and 600 years before the conquest, the Manderleys fled north. They were welcomed by the Starks, gifted the wolf's den and the white knife, and began laying the foundations for White Harbor. But of course, there's so much more to it than that. 
One does not simply walk from Dunstanbury to more to the north, right? <laughs> Even if we're wrong about them having been at the mouth of the Mander, anywhere along the Mander is really far away from the north. This means it's a question of how they got there. There's a lot of not-so-friendly territory to pass through between the Reach and the north, and it's not just the Ironborn who'd be eyeing that portable wealth they were bringing with them. And what kind of merman takes the land route? So perhaps they risk being caught by those very same Ironborn who would gladly take those riches and eat Merling for dinner. And maybe they risk the sea route. Which, you know, they're heading south around the bend. They might have been able to dodge the Ironborn. But if they didn't, then it would have been land. And that would be long and difficult and a great story worth telling. The Manderleys probably have this tale enshrined somewhere in their castle, written down somewhere. Maybe they tell it at formal occasions or something, or and they have singers sing about it, or all these different things. It seems to be an important part of their history. They, they talk about it enough. Though, maybe, maybe they even have paintings and murals of that, but if such exists, we haven't seen it through Davos' eyes anyway. And we don't know the story. Only we know that they claim it was difficult, and that the Stark saved them, and that they've never forgotten that, nor the oath that they swore to repay a debt that can never be repaid. But why go north in the first place, too? There's the, the difficulty of traveling there, but why pick it? Why was that their choice? Well, it was probably one of the only choices they had. Let's go through that. The wild Northmen, well, they, of course, don't have much to do with Southern politics. In a sense, that's a good thing, right? They don't have, they don't have sides in this fight. Note that they also had less trade with the other kingdoms back then, meaning the North. Since White Harbor didn't exist, the North was more isolated back then. So while the politically savvy families of the South would have, in some or many cases, wanted to shun the Manderleys to avoid being tarred with the same brush, the King of the Reach could have a long reach, after all. Huh? But the Northerners wouldn't have cared about that too much. They don't worry about the, what families are doing down there. It's none of their business. It's none of their concern. It doesn't affect them. So up the Manderleys traveled to depend on the honor of the direwolves. No less fierce than Ironborn, but also fierce about a custom that might give them a spark of hope. Something that could be their best chance. Guessed right. The Starks of, quote, our time seem to have inherited this maybe basic kindness from their ancestors of old because the Starks of this time, the Manderley time, took pity on the fleeing Manderleys and offered them land to settle and prosper on. Perhaps the Wolf King of the time had a strong reputation for generosity and honor. Or did he? There's a lot of pragmatism in play here. This isn't just a gift. White Harbor has worked out really well for the Starks, and that's in part because we are very much led to believe that they've always stayed loyal to the Starks. Now, it's too bad we don't know the name of whichever Stark King let the Manderleys in. Or, or his queen. Perhaps it was... You know, perhaps there was some byplay here. Maybe it was people behind the scenes that made this arrangement, that, that worked out the details of, of the Manderleys coming north. Perhaps it was, you know, that the queen that convinced the Wolf King of the value of House Manderley. Who knows? We also don't know the names of the Lord and Lady Manderley at the time either. The first ones who set foot in the north as residents. Perhaps one of them was a really good talker, really convincing, or just a great deal maker. Or maybe they had offered themselves as a solution to what was going on in the North, meaning maybe they had looked into Northern politics of the time and demonstrated a knowledge and a, and a way to help, a way to play into all that, because they certainly did. But either way, it seems to be an assumption that they chose to flee North. Well, they definitely fled, but maybe the king in the North invited them. Maybe he heard about it and was like, sniffed an opportunity and invited them to come. So maybe pity was just a part of it. Or maybe it was just the way they marketed it. It was like, look at my great generosity here. You know, because kings are supposed to be open-handed. That's a, that's a sign of strength in the real world and in Westeros. So a Stark king sees some low-hanging fruit, says, hey, we got this rich house here that is bringing something new to the table, some southern abilities, some skill sets that we don't have. Yeah. Also, the Stark King of the time would realize that these Southerners are no threat to him. No matter their history, no matter what 
overreaching they did in the South, it's not happening up here. At least not, at least not soon. The North is not going to rally behind a Southern house to overthrow the Starks, right? The North remembers, but at the time it had little to remember about them. <laughs> remember what Roos says to Jamie when the Kingslayer acts like the Boltons should be scared of Tywin. A Storm of Swords, Jamie 5. I would not advise it. Casterly Rock has a long memory. A thousand leagues of mountain, sea, and bog lie between my walls and your rock. Lannister enmity means little to Bolton. Well, Highgarden is, as you well know, even farther from the north than Casterly Rock. So it's safe to say that House Stark didn't fear the enmity of House Gardner a whole lot back then either. They were simply too many other kingdoms in between, plus all those nasty obstacles Roos just described. And he didn't even mention Winter, by the way. So it shouldn't be complicated, and it needn't be complicated. Surely the King in the North had considerations unknown to us. Certainly there were circumstances just that we're not privy to. But it's a sure thing that profit came to mind. You just cannot ignore that kind of wealth that the Manderley seemed to have. A smart king looks at these lords with lots of gold, and doesn't just see short-term profit, though. He doesn't just see, like, some loot to grab. Whichever Stark this was may have been such. Someone with a little bit more vision. Kings get to tax their lords, and lords who are good at making money are thus good to have. Right? It's a win-win situation. This is a great arrangement, potentially. And it did become that. The managers have gold, skill at making more, and need for land. Aren't terribly threatening. The North has never been a terribly rich place, but it does have lots of land. Great fit, right? So many things line up nicely. Again, this is a unique feature of the North, right? The, all the space. Land is an incredible commodity elsewhere, something every family wants, and rival houses would definitely not have been happy to have a slice of their pie handed out to some newcomer that hadn't earned it, right? There's maybe some resentment here. But this is the North, don't forget. And whether it was that the Stark bannermen were more loyal and listened more to noble Starks, or whether they were simply too fond of their own lands to really care, we don't know. We do have some idea, though, and I want to cover as much of this time frame as possible, meaning looking at the North and the rest of Westeros. And maybe why the Manders didn't pick a different region. State at the Union. Something I particularly enjoy doing during these history dives is taking a look at what we know about various ancient settings and then kind of piecing it all together. There's usually enough for us to figure out a few important things, while guesstimating at a few others through common sense, process of elimination, and such. All while taking the time to make sure we haven't missed anything by not rushing, right? George's material is meant to be taken slowly and thoughtfully, and we're rewarded by doing so. And this is a great time for it, too. Meaning, what was the North like when House Manderley arrived? And what was the rest of Westeros like at the time? It will help us further understand a lot of these circumstances, apart from just things like distance from the Reach and guest right, as reasons why the Manderleys would go North. Because those are good reasons, but... There might be more. There probably is more. So let's play around with this a little bit. With the caveat that, of course, it's difficult to correlate events that are described very vaguely as a thousand years ago. A brief tour around Westeros tells us that the Reach was probably having a bit of a power shift. As the departure of the Mandalese was a major event, right? Power vacuum. They were a huge power for uncountable years and now gone forever. Their castle went to the peaks, as we said, but as we supposed earlier, it may have been reduced in strength. That would explain why the Peaks didn't just, like, take over somehow. After all, Highgarden wouldn't have been wise to just give them that. Though it's true that House Peak became majorly involved at the highest level with the Targaryens and Blackfires? That's another story. But Dorne may have been smack dab in the middle of Nymeria's arrival. This would have been roughly around that time, a thousand years ago. It may have been in flux, and it was certainly interesting. But in any case, no Reach House would have been welcome in the in, in Dorne, and with or without Nymeria, I don't think. The Mandalorians probably never even considered that as an option. But what a cool parallel, right? Somewhere roughly around the time, the Roy and I were migrating to Dorne after fleeing the might of Valyria and traveling for a long time in between, the Mandalorians fled the Reach to head north, traveling for... Well, we don't know how long they traveled. It certainly wasn't as long as Nymeria. That took years and years. But still, strong parallel. The Riverlands were also, at this time, probably in flux. House Teague, which no longer exists, struggled to keep the Riverlands and the Riverlords together as a unit, while also fighting so many enemies. The problem there, of course, as it always is, Riverlands in the middle. 
Lots of enemies and not a lot of ways to defend against them. Though House Frey rose in the Riverlands some centuries after all of this by building that famous bridge, that seems to have been during a time of greater stability. This might explain why House Manderley didn't find a new home there in the Riverlands or didn't want to. One of the main enemies for House Teague was House Lannister, who had risen to greater prominence during the Andal era. Like the Reach did, they pushed back the Ironborn, enabling them to grow and expand rather than be on the defensive like the Reach was. So they, they kind of, around the same time, this all started happening. So maybe the West was a decent option, but probably not, actually, because the Lannisters already had a sweet setup with Lannisport right there. That's a thing that Casterly Rock has in its pocket that other cities and castles don't necessarily have. They have their seat of power right next to their seat of cash. <laughs> well, they also have their seat of cash below them with the mines. But it's a lot harder for Landisport to rise up and become a competing power when Castle Rock is just right there. And why would they want to set up another port so close? The West is also not very riverful. <laughs> well, that's not a word, but you understand what I'm saying. So it may just not have had a great spot for them. This all tells us the state of the Ironborn at the time, too. Recently pushed back by both of their main enemies, the West and the Reach. But... You know, the Iron Islands, like Dorne, was probably never really uh, on the table as a new home option anyway. I don't know why the Mandalays would want to go live there. The Stormlands has never been the best place for trade in the first place because of culture and terrain and weather, and it's also not that far from the Reach and Dorne. So, eh, not a great choice, probably. So that leaves the Vale and the North. The Vale have the same issue as the West. Not a lot of rivers, not a lot of space because of all the hills and mountains, and already a trading city in place, Galton. At the time, Gulltown, Lannisport, and Old Town were the only cities in Westeros. Nowadays there's five, but then there was only three. So the North had basically the best set of circumstances despite the bad weather and the huge cultural divide. They were able to take advantage of this great space that wasn't taken, but that was a process. That great space is great now, but it wasn't great back then. It was potentially great rather than actually great. They had to do a lot to turn it into what it is now, but that seemed to be House Manderley's kind of challenge. They were up for it, or at least it seems that way now because it clearly worked out. A lot had to happen before that though, right? It's time for us to talk about it. We started this section by looking at all of Westeros at the time of the Manderley Exodus. Now let's look at the North and its borders, then zoom in even closer on just the White Knife in that area, which is a really interesting area, Bloody, violent, mysterious, dark, cool, lots of stuff. But we're going to start with a short dive yeah, into the bodies of water in this region. The Shivering Sea. The White Knife flows into the Bight, and the Bight is part of the great and vast Shivering Sea, which stretches so far to the east, we don't know where it ends. The Sea Snake, Lord Corlys Valerian, explored as far as the Thousand Islands, which has strong evidence of the locals being human hybrid aquatic beings of some kind. There's that old saying, a fish out of water, and that definitely describes those people literally, but that saying is meant to be a metaphor, and in that it fits House Manderley perfectly, a southern house in the north. It's less true in modern times because, as we've said and we'll show more, they have assimilated to the North masterfully, while holding on to quite a lot of their South-run culture and tradition. But they're not out of place anymore. But right now, we're talking about when they first arrived on the scene, when they were out of place. And we're also talking about who was there before them. There were many interesting locals and uh, visitors, shall we call them? I mentioned earlier that the Shivering Sea is the ancient home to a different species of merling than those described in the Sunset Sea. It makes sense for separate merling species to exist for the same reasons different human species exist, I guess. And one particular global event had the reverse effects on merlings and their kin than it had on humanity. As Ygritte famously says after calling John a southerner, which baffles him because he was born in... Okay, well he was born in Dorne, but never mind that he grew up in the north, among northerners. In a brilliant scene about perspective, she gets him to realize and say, it's all in where you're standing. But that sentence lacks self-awareness if you're a sentient aquatic being. It's all in where you're swimming. Ahem. The breaking of the world. 
separated Essos and Westeros for good into two separate continents. But the breaking of the world combined the Narrow Sea with the Summer Sea into one body of water. And this was, of course, a very long time ago, when the ancestors of House Manderly may not have even been calling themselves that yet, meaning Manderly. <laughs> but they likely had migrated across that strip of land before it was destroyed, like so many of the other First Men. As those families of First Men came from many places and began to mingle and form a distinct new culture of their own, many families developed genetic traits that are still carried thousands of years later. It's part of the inherent magic of Westeros and perhaps the rest of the world, but I wouldn't assume so. It follows then that any and all ancient ancestors have a far, far greater impact on their descendants across millennia than they do in the real world. It's not a mistake to use real-world psychology to analyze George R. R. Martin's characters and how they behave, but it is a mistake to use real-world genetics to examine character and family traits. There's too much magic and just difference here. It just it falls apart if you try to use the real, real-world real science on it. And so that, my friends, is why we care so much about these Merlings. It's not just on their sigil. In addition to the possibility of Merlings from the West, we have these Merlings from the North and wherever else, too. These, shall we say, we'll call them Northern Merlings, sure. They are apparently of a darker shade and fiercer. Yeah, but did they carry tridents? Hmm? Do they eat a lot? <laughs> How are they at baking pies? Hmm. The suggestion that they're fiercer could be a result of environment, such as having more enemies to contend with. You never know what's going on down there, right? These are the same who may have overrun Lorath and traded with the King of the Vale. Who knows if they've attacked any areas in Westeros? Who knows what their motivations are in general? In ancient times, they may have come ashore. We saw Merlings and Selkies living on the Shield Islands in truly ancient times, so this is clearly possible, uh, at least seems possible. Some of this blood may exist in northern families, which may have found its way into the Manderly bloodline. They may have, like, two different lines of Merling blood in there somehow. And George loves to get cute with his references. He loves to get sneaky with them. We mentioned... Very briefly, offhand mentioned skin changer walruses, and there's that term walrus mustache. If you don't know what that is, picture Wilford Brimley or Ron Swanson or Teddy Roosevelt or Nietzsche. Well, guess who the only two characters get, are in the entirety of A Song of Ice and Fire who have that description, meaning who have walrus mustaches. These two characters also happen to be large and have shaved heads. That's right. Willis and Wendell Manderley, you guessed it. That's another easy cookie question there. Maybe those two should have a walrus sigil instead of a merman. Or at least maybe widen the merman a little bit. The Bite, A Dance with Dragons, Davos 2. The Merry Midwife stole into White Harbor on the evening tide, her patched sail rippling with every gust of wind. She was an old cog, and even in her youth no one had ever called her pretty. Her figurehead showed a laughing woman holding an infant by one foot, but the woman's cheeks and the babe's bottom were both pocked by wormholes. Uncounted layers of drab brown paint covered her hull. Her sails were gray and tattered. She was not a ship to draw a second glance, unless it was to wonder how she stayed afloat. The merry midwife was known in White Harbor, too. For years, she had plied a humble trade between there and Sisterton. This dilapidated ship sets the stage for us here at the end of the Shivering Sea in a body of water known as the Bight. It lies between the North and the Vale, and there's a lot of history, a lot of bloody history shared here. When the Manderleys arrived, some of that bloody history was current events. Bloody current events. Another thousand years before the Manderleys came on the scene, the North and the Vale began fighting over the Three Sisters, islands smack dab in the middle of the Bight, and home to the just-mentioned Sisterton. If you've ever played the Game of Thrones board game, you know how important the Bight is strategically, and that's well played by the game designers because it seems accurate to Westeros. I say seems because we haven't seen any wars there in during A Song of Ice and Fire proper. But we would see that if we went back to this time, which is when the Vale and the North went to war in this body of water and did so for a long time. Currently, they've been sharing it in peace for a long time. But back then, wars were a semi-frequent thing, and given that it's the only shared border between the North and the Vale, it all happened in this area, the Bight. The reason we quoted that Davos came in on a broken-down ship is in part because, hey, 
It's a good quote. I don't need to explain myself. <laughs> no, it's to illustrate how much the region has changed. The North attacked the Three Sisters because they were sick of all the pirates who lived there. If the Manderleys did flee north by ship, they might have had to contend with this on their way. Imagine a dilapidated ship, though, trying to survive and make a living via trade when piracy was rampant in that area. It wouldn't happen. The bite would not have been safe back then for a dilapidated ship to go back and forth between, well, it couldn't have gone back and forth between White Harbor and the Sisters because there was no White Harbor. But it wouldn't be going back and forth between anywhere if it was dilapidated when there's pirates around. Yeah, that's just suicide. Sounds a lot like trying to trade at the mouth of the Mander before the Shield Islands were fortified, doesn't it? It sounds very familiar. What a parallel. If you're running a port town, you absolutely want ships of all sizes and kinds coming in. You want everyone trading there, and you do not want anyone in the area worried about pirates. You want even dilapidated ships to feel safe. And that quote says this little ship has been going back and forth from White Harbor to Three Sisters for years. So it seems they're safe, and they may feel safe too. The Manderleys were very familiar with this scenario. The Iron Man and the Sister Men are both very, like, piratical peoples. They both live in poor regions that lack natural resources and don't have good farmland. A major difference, though, is that the Sisters are nowhere near as large or as powerful as the Iron Islands. The Iron Islands have rarely been invaded, despite all the times they provoked others. But the Sisters, when they provoked the North, there was no chance they could fight them off. Not alone, anyway. Indeed, it was a great slaughter. The Sisters were overwhelmed, and awful things were done. The stories don't really read like justice. They really read like bloody revenge or something worse. We hear of one... Belthazar Bolton, of course it's a Bolton, making a pavilion, meaning, you know, a giant tent, out of a hundred flayed sister men. Damn, wow. Surely not all of the sister men were pirates, so uh, maybe some innocents were killed there. And even the ones who were pirates probably didn't deserve that. Just, just hang them, be done with it. And I don't know about this savagery, you know. Maybe this is a hint, though. Maybe it wasn't just piracy. Perhaps it was just a side effect of piracy. What I mean by that is that pirates and raiders are known to burn things when they leave. And it's one thing to burn a home or a holdfast. It's another thing to burn a godswood or a heart tree. That is a lot more likely, or potentially more likely, to anger the Northmen than piracy. Regardless of the trigger, though, these brutal reprisals are how the veil got drawn in. The sisters said, hey, we'll permanently swear allegiance to the veil, to the king of the veil, and all their descendants, if you just come get these Northmen out. The queen of the veil at the time told her husband, the king, do not get involved. He should have listened. She was so right. This war began... 2,000 years ago and ended a 1,000 years ago. It wasn't a 1,000 years in a row of fighting, though. It was off and on, back and forth. But in the end, no one really came out ahead. I suppose you could say the Vale won, because after all that time, the Starks just gave up. They may have realized that they were only fighting because of what they had been doing for so long. Like, ah, we gotta keep fighting back. They're, they hurt us, we hurt them, and the cycle of violence continues. You don't back down from a fight when you're a northerner, well, you probably don't really do that as a Veilman either when you're, uh, you know, a warrior type. But the, the fact is, the original reasons they had come to the sisters, either to stop the burning of hard trees or to stop piracy or, to, or both, it just wasn't an issue anymore. The Veil now is in charge of the sisters. Piracy, well, they didn't sponsor that. The Veil's not about sending out pirates, so maybe that just kind of took care of itself. And if you see the sisters through Davos's point of view... It's a reminder of how little they were fighting over. The sisters are really, really downtrodden, really poor, really bleak. So yeah, why are they fighting over that exactly? But a bigger reason may have been all the other things that happened also circa a thousand years ago. In particular, the arrival of the Manderleys changed the big picture in the bite. Why would they need those unruly poor islands when they could just build a port closer to home? And not just closer, bigger. Richer. 
and more loyal. But loyal is not exactly permanent. They didn't know the Manderleys would be so loyal for so long at the start before they had proven it. When the same family can contain all of our and Black Walder, you can't exactly predict what's coming, right? And families produce very different outcomes among their descendants. So as a king, what are you to do? Well, in the North, many believe an oath sworn in front of a heart tree cannot be broken without retribution from the old gods. So I suppose that's what you do. When Davos arrives at White Harbor, he sees a ship called the Storm Dancer from Tyrosh. It must be a familiar ship to the locals. This is the same fast trading galley that brought Catelyn and Sir Roderick to King's Landing from White Harbor. The Promise. As luck would have it, the Starks had a tract of land that they needed someone to tend. And as we said earlier, they probably really wanted someone to tend it. They saw the profit quite possibly. But the place along the White Knife is called the Wolf's Den. It's an old fort. The Mandalays were allowed to settle there in exchange for not only a promise to protect the land, but to stay loyal to the Starks for all time. It's worth noting that the solemn oaths here that the Mandalays are so proud of were made in the Wolf's Den. So it seems the Mandalays were received at Winterfell. Then after some time, maybe some negotiating, some setting things up, some, you know, logistics. The Starks and Mandalays and other northern houses too probably went along. They had some, they all went to the Wolf's Den. They had a ceremony. It was maybe like this big procession. It was probably kind of unheard of, of a thing happening in the north like that. A Dance with Dragons, Davos Three. I know about the promise, insisted the girl. Maester the Amor, tell them. A thousand years before the conquest, a promise was made, and oaths were sworn in the wolf's den before the old gods and the new. When we were sore, beset, and friendless, hounded from our homes and in peril of our lives, the wolves took us in, and nourished us, and protected us against our enemies. The city is built upon the land they gave us. In return, we swore that we should always be their men. Stark men. The note about these oaths being made in front of two sets of gods is also pretty important. Also might have been fairly unique too, along with this, this scene that we're setting up here. Because it, it seems that right from the jump, the Manderleys stayed true to their faith. And the Starks accepted that. Maybe a little bit of the fact that the Starks wouldn't be worried about worshippers of the Seven ever generating a real rebellion. Maybe that was part of why they were cool with them keeping that religion. But also it allowed the Manderleys to ensure their own traditions were honored. Any Northerners who didn't trust Southerners might be swayed by this because remember, if you believe, if you have faith in your gods and you see someone else swear to those gods and you believe that your gods enforce oaths, that might be good enough for you. You might be like, well, I don't know if I can trust those Manderleys, but the old gods will sort them out if they lie. Right? I think that's a, probably a a way a faithful northerner might react to the situation. Certainly not all of them, but I, I, you know, I think a lot of them would look that way. And the ones who were skeptical, maybe over time, well, the Mandalays have proven themselves. As far as we know, we, we have no examples of disloyalty. That the Mandalays kept their god is perhaps uh, more going on here. It's, it may be George reminding us that the old gods are, they're just that. They're the old gods. I don't mean just in name. I mean that New followers aren't being created outside the North anyway. Even this house that moved here and fully integrated didn't adopt them. Catelyn Stark didn't either. The Starks of the time may have known that forcing their, their religion on anyone wouldn't work. It's just too different. The Northern religion is just too, like, you gotta grow up with that. You gotta be born into that. You can't just, like, this is what you guys do. You sacrifice, you do blood sacrifice in front of trees? Wait, what? That's a bit much to get used to when you're used to. Uh, worshipping the Seven. This, but this, again, the Starks could afford to be flexible. The Manderleys weren't the only ones in need. The Starks needed someone who knew how to handle this region. We talked about the, about the profit potential here, but it's not just that. The bite was a constant issue. It wasn't just a potential profit center. It was a problem that needed to be solved. The pirates, of course, from the sisters, and maybe farther out. There was the slavers that are certainly from farther out. Instability at the wolf's den with disloyal vassals constantly, you know, needing to be switched out or dying out. And then there's the Boltons. Remember, this is a thousand years ago. The Boltons weren't fully settled. I mean, they're not fully settled now. So 
but back then they were even more, you know, uh, likely to, to rise up or seize an opportunity. And on top of that, you got the veil, the veil being arrayed against the North for so long with that war. This is what the Mandalus became part of. This is what they jumped into the middle of and had a big role in transforming all that into what we're familiar with now. From den to city. We talked about what was going on in other kingdoms at the time, and that's really fun for us, and I hope it's fun for you. But for the Manderleys at the time, you know, they were probably too desperate and too busy worrying about where they were going to live to be worried about like big picture stuff like politics. You don't usually worry about you know, plans for the future when you, you don't even know where you're going to live. you got, you got to take care of the, the present in a situation like that. But politics and power don't care if you're interested in them. They're forces of human nature that move on whether you're participating or not. So they had to make the most of what their of their new situation quickly so they could get back to being players in the Game of Thrones. It's kind of like their, their natural uh, place to be. <laughs> and it wouldn't be long before they get into that political mix again. You can't keep a good, ambitious merman down. Now that they had some land in the wolf's den, it was time to make that new territory a home, right? You gotta adapt and build and meet your neighbors and <laughs> do all that. So the, to the south, we just saw the Vale had at least become a decent neighbor over time, and maybe was by this time. To the west was the Neck and Winterfell. That's all good. There's no enemies over there. The Neck is no one's going to come out of the Neck and attack White Harbor. Not in these days, anyway. And to the east, Sheepshead Hills, Widow's Watch, and the Narrow Sea. None of these lands nearby contained threats that we know of, and eventually came to be dominated by and loyal to White Harbor. Wyman Manderley is extremely confident in that, as he tells Davos, and maybe past Manderleys have been as well. Maybe that's why Wyman is so confident, because he's seen how his vassals have behaved over the years through the histories. It's hard to imagine Manderley vassals switching to the Seven, but you might see some adopt dual worship just to pay homage and to maybe get in good graces with their liege lord. It's not like the Northerners think the Seven don't exist, after all. They just think they're not as powerful as the old gods, especially in the north. And by the way, these are all the lands of lesser lords, so it's not really surprising that House Manderley kind of rose above them, given their wealth and superior land holdings. Despite the promise, though, I imagine there was some resentment, despite what we said about them taking the oath seriously. There had to be a few outliers. The southern house being placed above northern houses, that had to bother a few people. But these were lesser houses. What are they going to do about it? And in current times, we hear nothing of such resentment, which is, again, another sign the Manderleys are fully integrated. But back then, there might have been someone who was willing to listen to such a grievance about these, the Southern House being placed above them. There is someone who would be looking for an opportunity to move against Winterfell, a chance to topple the wolves. Someone who doesn't need an excuse to hate the Starks, but might jump at the chance of giving one. The problem, the possible enemy, then, is the house that is their greatest enemy now. House Bolton of the Dreadfort, of course. They need no introduction. Guess how long ago they officially bent the knee to House Stark? Yep, another easy cookie question. A thousand years ago. Uh, to be fair, though, the history of House Stark uh, versus House Bolton is pretty murky. It's too long to go into here, but we'll stick with the relevant bits. It seems to have been very much a process for the Starks. Beat the Boltons, they submit, repeat, mixing in a few setbacks where the Boltons win, or at least do something awful like flay and wear a Stark. <laughs> so whether it was a conscious, long-term plan or not, the Dreadfort was gradually surrounded by ostensibly Stark loyalist houses. Carhold, founded... A thousand years ago. Yes, indeed it was. So, all of this may have come fairly close together. Depending on the timing, it might have been what finally kept the Boltons in check. You know, obviously they still made their move from time to time, but it's a lot harder when you got Carhold to your east, White Harbor to the south. Before those two were around, it was just the Dreadfort and Winterfell kind of facing off. It was almost a straight line you could draw between them without a lot around them. But the political picture changed a lot around this era. And it's hard to find allies you can count on for the long term, right? Like I said, the Car Starks may have seemed like a great idea at the time, but here they are allied with the Boltons in A Song of Ice and Fire. And there's that other old cadet branch called the Grey Starks, who also supported the Boltons. So if White Harbor were to ever support the Dreadfort, 
they could topple the Starks. So this could backfire. This could have backfired very easily. They could have been setting up the method for their own demise by creating a power that could eventually ally with somebody else. This is probably why they made such a big deal about the promise. They couldn't have future Manderly siding with future Boltons. Right now, Manderly is helping restore the Starks, and he's willing to, you know, work with Stannis and all this. But, boy, just imagine if it had gone some other way. They just really, it, it's almost like they, their promise was about staying loyal to the Starks, but we think about that in terms of maybe foreigners. But it's really, it was probably more to do with House Bolton than anybody else. Maybe even just like vastly more important than any other consideration was the Dreadfort. So the placement of White Harbor was more than just about trade and uh, their access to the North was more than just a way for the Wolf King to get paid. It was about permanently changing the balance of power in the North. Uh, as we said earlier, a power vacuum was created in the Reach when they left, but that power didn't vanish, it just moved North <laughs> and it became allied with the Starks to threaten the Boltons. It also permanently connected the North and the South in the way that it hadn't before. White Harbor very much changed the North forever. Of course, it changed the immediate region the most, and in more so in the short term. It went from problematic to profitastic. So let's take an even closer look at the Manderley's immediate home. The White Knife. Like the Mander, the White Knife is far too large to be controlled by a single house, and it's the largest in the region also. There are three forks. One originating in the mountains near Long Lake, another coming from Long Lake itself. Those two merge together into a single branch, with the third branch starting near Winterfell. Those two waterways then combine just off the southeast corner of the Wolfswood, and then they continue on into the Bight, flowing right past White Harbor. So with Dunstanbury a distant memory, the Starks gave their new bannermen this old castle, again, the Wolf's Den. The name had been around since the castle was built, but it was certainly handy as a potential reminder to any newborn Manderleys about who they owed their family allegiance to. You gotta remember the promise. The Wolf's Den had a considerable history of its own. We've discussed much of this in previous episodes, but we need a few refreshers here. Don't want to retread old ground, but gotta get ourselves situated again. King John Stark had raised the Wolf's Den when raiders from the Eastern Sea appeared on the northern shores. Deciding that the North needed a permanent defensive location, that's what the castle was all about. The Wolf's Den was about keeping these invaders out. But who to man it? Apparently no bannermen were considered, as the Stark Kings kept handing it off to younger brothers, or uncles, or second sons, or what have you. Eventually, you could kind of say it was Winterfell South, in a sense. And this was done to agree that you started seeing the cadet branches starting popping up, like the Grey Starks I mentioned earlier. And they were the most prominent, and held it for the longest. Five whole centuries before the failed rebellion, where they joined the Boltons. And after that awkwardness of siding with the Boltons, the Starks said, well, let's not do that again. Let's try something else. A Dance with Dragons, Davos IV. House Flint held it for a century, House Locke for almost two. Slates, Longs, Holtz, and Ashwoods had held sway here, charged by Winterfell to keep the river safe. Reavers from the Three Sisters took the castle once, making it their toehold in the north. During the wars between Winterfell and the Vale, it was besieged by Osgood Arryn, the Old Falcon, and burned by his son, the one remembered as the Talon. When old King Edric Stark had grown too feeble to defend his realm, the Wolf's Den was captured by slavers from the Stepstones. They would brand their captives with hot irons and break them to the whip before shipping them across the sea. And these same black stone walls bore witness. Those wars mentioned here between the Winterfell and the Vale are the same ones we mentioned in the last section, as you probably guessed. And you can see here, as badly as it went giving it to Bannermen, why didn't they try that idea earlier? <laughs> I don't know. A major power like the Vale coming in with an army and doing damage is one thing, but slavers taking over? That's unexpected and pretty embarrassing for the North to be, like, invaded by a really distant power. What the slavers did to the slaves was horrible and unjust. I mean, that goes without saying. But what the North did to them was more horrible, yet more just. I mean, slavers deserve most of what's done to them. And an example of the North remembering, right? They remembered what they did and gave it back to them in kind. It's also not just the North remembering, it's of the North dismembering. 
The taking back of the wolf's den, like the rape of the three sisters and Balthazar Bolton, is so not a tale for children. Following King Edric, Snowbeard, was his great-grandson King Brandon, known as Ice Eyes, who came with the new winter. Reportedly, he stripped the slavers naked and gave them to those they had enslaved down in the dungeons. In their vengeance, the newly freed slaves hung the entrails of their captors among the heart trees as an offering to the old gods. Imagine getting a new home and finding that out about the tree in your backyard. <laughs> or imagine finding out fisher folk of the first men had sacrificed merlings to heart trees. Imagine that, catching one of those in your net and being like, what the hell do we do with this thing? I know, let's sacrifice it to the heart tree. <laughs> or just Imagine that. Don't even imagine them doing that. Just imagine that whole thing. Like Merlings and Ancient North. It's just the whole thing is crazy and creepy and mysterious and awesome. In H.P. Lovecraft's works, which we know George was heavily influenced by, fish, frog, human hybrids have been known to sacrifice regular humans. Well, this would be that in reverse. So the idea is out there. When the Mandalays were taken in by the Starks, perhaps in an attempt to put their own stamp on things, you kind of say they softened up this dark history around the area. I mean, who'd want to come trade an area with that history? But hey, if there's this nice new white marble city that pops up and has this great reputation, people could easily forget about that dark ancient past. You know, it's just definitely not a good look for trade. You know, like, yeah, come trade here. We're the place where entrails used to hang in the trees all the time. <laughs> all that southern culture, too, would help attract other Southerners to not be intimidated by these same stories. It probably helped kickstart the area. All that Southern culture may have really helped create that new image. Getting rid of that old image, as much as it was a family tradition, it really helped this situation a lot. Well, rather than living in the aged and bloody Wolsten, gosh, I wonder why, the family began to build their own new castle called Newcastle. But they didn't take down or ignore the old den they converted into a prison, which poor Davos gets to see firsthand. And Davos is the series' top cell dweller over Tyrion and Edmure. This is a smart move, really. I don't mean throwing Davos in jail. I mean making the wolf's den into a prison. I mean, a prison's extra creepy when it has that history in it, you know? And you don't want to live in a place like that, but you want to use it. So, hey, perfect place to put your prisoners. Yeah. And, of course, this is all a big part of Davos' arc in Against the Dragons. And that chapter in particular, of course, is Davos 4, nicknamed the North Remembers, is one of our Aziz First Chapter episodes, currently available to patrons and donors. Sir Marlon Manderley, he says that it's been centuries since White Harbor has seen any wildlings, which implies it had been a problem in the past. During his stay in the Wolf's Den, Davos meets Sir Bartimus. You know him, the old one-legged knight who is Castellan of the Wolf's Den. He was raised to the title after saving Wyman Manderley's life during the Battle of the Trident and is said to have ancestors among the slaves who were freed by Ice Eyes. Whoa. He points out that his ancestors were among those who hung entrails in the heart trees as sacrifice. Think about this in the light of the rape of the three sisters, and it will remind you why the sisters invited the Vale to come drive out these old god worshippers. And think of this in light of what the cultured southern Manderleys were used to when they first moved here. Maybe a bit like Selyse Baratheon trying to get comfortable at Castle Black or the Night Fort amidst weather she's never encountered, surrounded by wildlings and old tales of horror. She's a long way from Storm's End, just like they are a long way from Dunstanbury and the Mander. The World of Ice and Fire Consider Maester Yorick's Wed to the Sea being an account of the history of White Harbor from its earliest days, which recounts the practice of blood sacrifice to the old gods. Such sacrifices persisted as recently as five centuries ago, according to accounts from Maester Yorick's predecessors at White Harbor. So we must always keep in mind that despite the new packaging and significant growth the Manderleys have overseen in the area, history is dark, and the North remembers. I've said it before and I'll say it again, that is meant to be taken literally. Men like Sir Bartimus remember, and the trees themselves, the Werewood Net, it does too. The heart tree at White Harbor has seen it all. All of this. What became before, and it's going to see what comes after, most likely. That includes the arrival of the Manderleys, and I definitely wonder how they felt. The werewood net, meaning? How does the, does the werewood net even feel? But, but they, they, they certainly noticed the Manderleys arriving, and what did, what did that mean to them? What did the werewood net, what did all the old gods, what did all the green singers 
What do they all think of this when it happened? Did they foresee it? Had they already seen it before it was coming? Did they see it as the end of their old traditions? Did they see it as the first step towards that? Or did they see that as inevitable one way or the other? Good questions, but not ones that have answers. It was desperation and bravery that led the Manderleys north, and they probably found a lot about their new home that scared them. I've certainly given you plenty of things that fit that description. But out of all of it, the heart tree may be the most scary of all because it reminds them of all of this. It's emblematic of all of those things we just talked about, and it's certainly a reminder that they're not in the South. The Manderleys who lived when heart trees were common in the South were long gone by this time. But like the original first men arriving in Westeros, those trees scared them so badly that they started chopping them down. And that caused war with the children, who may have accepted their arrival otherwise. You know, had they not burned the heart trees down, the children might have been like, all right, these guys are okay, we don't like them, but they're not doing us any harm. Likewise, had the Manderleys cut down any heart trees? They would not have been accepted in the North, I don't think. It may have been scary, but they knew where they were, and they're not about to go all sacrilegious. And they took that promise seriously. We know that because of how much time has passed. That meant adapting, being where they were. Lots of adapting was needed. But it also didn't mean forgetting where they came from. In fact, you could say remembering where they came from was where they were able to maintain their success. It's how they were able to stay successful, how they were able to become a powerful, wealthy house again. They got back to doing what they seemed to be great at before their big move, which is building wealth. White Harbor. It's interesting to note that White Harbor is mentioned before House Manderly. It comes in A Game of Thrones, Catelyn 3, when she's formulating her plan to take ship from White Harbor to King's Landing to inform Ned of the attack on Bran. Over the coming centuries, White Harbor was built on and expanded, went from, you know, whatever it started at to what it is now. And even though it's the smallest of Westerosi cities and the youngest until King's Landing came along, you know, it's still a really amazing place, really valuable and nice compared to the other cities. Because a lot of the wealth they put right back into the city itself. Some of it decorative. Quite a lot of it appears to be infrastructure spending and such. Um, (laughs) Davos mentions an old smuggler that he knows who said that every port has a different smell and that White Harbor smells like a mermaid. Well, that's appropriate. And he means that kind of as a compliment, (laughs) because most ports stink. The Manderleys themselves oversaw the construction of Newcastle, the one built just like Dunstanbury, as much as possible anyway. Between the Wolf's Den and the Newcastle is the Castle Stair, a broad white stone street which gives a view of both of the city's harbors before finishing at the thick, pale walls of Newcastle. This is, like I said, this is a really impressive place. A Dance with Dragons, Davos 2. Castle Stair was a street with steps, a broad white stone way that led up from the Wolf's Den by the water to the new castle on its hill. Marble mermaids lit the way as Davos climbed, bowls of burning whale oil cradled in their arms. When he reached the top, he turned to look behind him. From here he could see down into the harbors, both of them. Behind the jetty wall, the inner harbor was crowded with war galleys. Davos counted twenty-three. Lord Wyman was a fat man, but not an idle one, it seemed. We learn a fair bit from that particular Davos chapter as his walks by old haunts and friendlier than most brothels and inns. He knows the place. He's been there a lot of times. And he knows how smugglers are. He knows how ports work. Undoubtedly, it's still Westeros. So White Harbor is is no shining beacon of loveliness despite what I said. You know, it just is so compared to the other ports maybe. But it's definitely nowhere near the dive that King's Landing is. At least not according to Davos. And, you know, Davos knows what he's talking about when it comes to ports, I would think. A Dance with Dragons, Davos 2. Davos had always been fond of this city since first he'd come here as a cabin boy on Cobblecat. Though small compared to Old Town and King's Landing, it was clean and well-ordered with wide, straight, cobbled streets that made it easy for a man to find his way. The houses were built of whitewashed stone, with steeply pitched roofs of dark gray slate. Roro Uhoris, the Cobblecat's cranky old master, used to claim that he could tell one port from another just by the way they smelled. Cities were like women, he insisted. Each one had its own unique scent. Old Town was as flowery as a perfumed dowager. Lannisport was a milkmaid, fresh and earthy, with wood smoke in her hair. King's Landing reeked like some unwashed whore, but White Harbor's scent was sharp and salty, and a little fishy, too. She smells the way a mermaid ought to smell, Rora said. She smells of the sea. 
the fact that it's so well organized and laid out, it was like a city planning, right? It's it's not what you see with King's Landing, which is like this crazy sprawl of chaos with streets just winding and bending. I kind of think that this is a product of Manderley experience. They had done something like this before and they knew how to not repeat the mistakes. They knew what worked well and set out to do it right. And cities, really, like, who in the North would have had experience with such a thing? Who living in the North at the time would have been able to even remotely approach what, what the Mandalays were able to pull off? They just don't have that experience. Cities are just a thing that the North didn't have experience with, hardly at all, until a thousand years ago. So they also wouldn't have much idea or experience in governing such a place. But again, the Mandalays do. So again, perfect. So this is probably a big part of why they've been so accepted because they're doing something that they're kind of filling a gap that the northern northerners can't really fill on their own very well, at least not, not with this kind of skill and experience. So whether the northerners value it as a city, it's significant for the region, regardless of what people think of it. It's the center of trade up there, both local goods, from upriver and other places in Westeros and beyond can be found. It's true that the North is poor compared to other kingdoms. You know, Asha really demonstrated that well at the King's Moot with her chests of pine cones and such. But White Harbor is an exception. She was exaggerating a bit for effect. You know, and also she was talking about the west side of the North, not the east, which is totally different because the east is closer to all, a lot more trading centers along the Narrow Sea, the Free Cities, etc. The west coast of the north, there's nothing. <laughs> but there's valuable goods in the north that Asha, you know, decided not to mention because it wouldn't have helped her point. You know, furs, amber, certain types of wood, right? That, that stuff would be particularly valuable in places where it doesn't grow. I mean, where, where if, if you live in Dorne, where the heck are you going to get bear skins, right? So it was like a huge boost to the economy, most likely. Local traders would not take long to catch on that White Harbor was the place to be, the center of everything. And over time, this would hugely impact House Manderley, perhaps like it did in the South once trade began to flow, when the Ironborn were finally pushed back. You know, around this time is when the, the bite cleared up, the pirates were done, the Vale and the North weren't fighting anymore. White Harbor, for that reason, may have developed quickly. It wouldn't have taken long for word to spread to the other ports, the free cities, certainly local ones in Westeros, Gull Town, Old Town, Lannisport, etc. And eventually King's Landing, when it was built, of course, they, you know, White Harbor had been around for hundreds of years when King's Landing was built. And remember, too, that White Harbor is the doorway to the north. It's not just a port, it's the main way to get there. Think about how bad the neck is for travel. It's all that, the swamps and Krannic men and it being so long... You, you want to take ship. It's much better. You know, it's faster. It's easier to sail up the narrow sea, flow th into the bite and up wi into White Harbor. It's just it's safer than other ports, too. There's no ironborn over there. Like we said, there's no wildlings this far south. Sure, there's still pirates and storms and more, but we're talking relative safety. There's plenty of dangers on land, too, and it's faster. So this is kind of a side effect for making White Harbor large and juicy is that because everyone comes through it, just about, not literally everyone, because it's such a center of back and forth and travel and everything, it's a great spot for spying, which Davos is doing when he shows up there. He's checking it out before he goes meet Lord Manderly. He's listening to what people are talking about. He goes and, and talks to people and gets information out of them. It's pretty cool. That's also, partly how the southern element in White Harbor was able to maintain itself. You, you constantly have other southerners coming in to trade there. So, you know, southern culture isn't exactly isolated amongst only the Manderleys there. You got all kinds of visitors. So it's kind of a lifeline to the wider realm. And, of course, the Manderleys are bound to exploit that as well as they can. Not just taxes. Remember what I said about spies and information gathering. Guarantee the Manderleys, at least some of them, have been on top of that and realize how much information there is to be had and how valuable that is. But White Harbor's also kind of hard to compare to some of the other places. It's easy to just compare in some ways because there's so much unique about it. One worth making, one comparison worth making, which is not too far away, is Bravos. Bravos is really powerful, and while it's a fair bit to the east, 
It's only a little bit south. They're kind of on this, almost on the same like meridian or whatever you want to call it. Bravos's power comes in large part from its fleet, which spans the globe. And in that, it's very unlike White Harbor. White Harbor has ships, but mostly river ships. Remember earlier I mentioned that, that Wyman Mandalay doesn't have, you know, sailors so much as he has rivermen. But this really just shows you how powerful Bravos is. Not a we it's not a weakness for White Harbor. This point is going to become more relevant later, because as we know, Wyman Mandalay has been building ships. But that's still a few hundred years away in our timeline here. White Harbor isn't just prepared for trade, it's prepared for war. As it is now, it probably was then. Before White Harbor was a thing, it was definitely prepared for war. The first men left a ring fort out in the entrance to the harbor. That's really ancient. This is a huge stone thing used to ward off invited guests, basically. The stones kind of went unused for centuries, but then the Mandalays kind of reused it to base their new fortifications around, you know, take advantage of the natural features or the features left behind by previous builders. Then, on top of that, we have these two separate harbors, which is a little bit unusual. The Davos spots and makes note of, of course, Davos is going to be very aware of such things. A dance with dragons, Davos 2. That jetty wall conceals the inner harbor, he realized, as the merry midwife was pulling down her sail. The outer harbor was larger, but the inner harbor offered better anchorage, sheltered by the city wall on one side and the looming mass of the wolf's den on another, and now by the jetty wall as well. At East Watch by the Sea, Cotter Pike told Davos that Lord Wyman was building war galleys. There could have been a score of ships concealed behind those walls, waiting only a command to put to sea. Of course, what's behind the wall is interesting, but that also comes later. The wall itself, though, is just telling, really telling just by itself. It is... A mile long, reportedly? 30 feet thick? Towers punctuating every 100 yards? That is probably way bigger than a lot of you thought it would be. It's bigger than I kind of thought. I never really truly looked at dimensions. I only had a sense that it was big because it's a city, but it was the smallest city. And you know, we get what we read in these Davos chapters over and over. But a mile long? Damn, you would need a huge army to take that. Also, the new castle has a godswood. And there's a sept in White Harbor. It's called the Sept of Snows. That's kind of cool. It's like the sept, sept of Bastards? What? <laughs> a great dome building with statues of the Seven are inside. As we know, other septs to be like in other kingdoms. It's kind of like that. It's here that Sir Wendell Manderley's bones are eventually laid to rest. I suppose other Manderleys are laid to rest there as well. So in addition to enriching the region, creating trade and opportunity for many, in addition to changing the balance of power in the north, White Harbor also created a portal for the north to connect with other regions and for the cultures to grow closer together, which is a good thing in the long term for creating relationships and, and they understand each other better, maybe they're a little less likely to go to war. But not just the north and not just the south, but the free cities and beyond. Any place that had traded with the North before would have been doing so on a smaller scale because there, weren't, there wasn't this large trading center to deal with. A major new trading center in a place that didn't have one before is going to attract the eye of the entire known world. All their trade goods started spreading to places that they had only spread in very small amounts before. But this also attracts the eye of winter. When the others inevitably get through or around the wall, the people of White Harbor would surely be a great addition to the great army of the dead. Because there's so many of them. If Danny's dreams are true and the others will reach at least the trident, White Harbor's way behind. That's way back in the north. As far as it is south in the north, it's still way north of the trident. So White Harbor might be doomed. But we can hope House Manderley lives on. They escaped once, got back to it again. Maybe they can do so this time as well. And maybe they'll be able to reclaim their city after it's all said and done from winter. When and if the War for the Dawn is won. Outro. Something that this topic really reminded me of is that these house histories are not just coverage of a particular house. They are like a perspective, like a house POV that we look at the greater historical picture through. Because history, real or fantasy, doesn't happen in a vacuum. Anyone covering history, whether it's podcasting, whether it's writing, whether it's just telling a story to your friends, you have to deal with context. You have to decide how much context to include. I personally prefer 
too much context to too little. Either one can be confusing, but with more context, you at least have more to play with. It's more fun, more to think about. If you've listened to this episode all the way through and are a general fan of this show, you're probably like me. You probably prefer more context to too little. There's plenty of other people out there that are doing summaries and shorter things. That's not our game. By following a house through the hat lens of a particular role in a particular setting, we see entirely new things, new contexts, and we see old things in a new light. And we also see the sea, the shivering sea, the narrow sea, the sunset sea, in a new light as well, or given their depths, a new dark. In part two, we will cover House Manderley's significant relationship with houses Targaryen and Stark, the scope of their ambitions over time, including recent plots in the north ranging from Winterfell to Hornwood to the Dreadfort and, of course, Skagos, and a dive into the current members of the house that we see in A Song of Ice and Fire to help you get it all straight and help prepare for what's coming. Until then, Valar reread us. Many people to thank, as usual, for this episode. It is a group effort, even though I'm the only one you see here. That doesn't mean a lot of people didn't have a lot to do with creating this episode. As always, Ashe is the best. That hasn't changed, and, you know, it's not very likely to. She did a lot of great work on production, as usual, making everything look great. Big thanks to Joe Buckley, our co-writer, who who wrote a large portion of this one and a larger portion of part two that's, of course, coming soon. Big ups to him. Also, big thanks to Nina Friel, Good Queen Alley on Tumblr, who I talked through a lot of this ancient history stuff with and help bounce ideas off of her. She's always ready at the drop of the hat to talk Game of Thrones with me, and I find that very valuable, especially considering her knowledge is very deep. Of course, big thanks to Michael Klarfeld for the maps, for the video intro, and for being awesome. For folks who don't know, he's got a new Iron Islands map out, and it is fantastic. Go check out Claradox with a K, K-L-A-R-A-D-O-X dot D-E, and check it out. Of course, thanks to Joey and Jesse, Joey Townsend, Jesse Koval, who made our intro and outro music, respectively. And here comes our honor roll, the rest of our patrons, whose support gives them a verbal shout-out at the end of each episode, starting off with the mysterious BR, Hand of the King, Lady Suzanne Sinistral, the Learned, holder of the left-handed Valyrian shields called Penance and Hand of the Beard. Lord Jim the Fortuitous of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog is our Warden of the West and host of the Two Wage War podcast. Lord George Stormsville the Cunning is Lord of the Chiliad and Warden of the East. Cabeth the Unfrozen is Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light, Defender of the Old Gods and Warden of the North. Also thanks to Lady Kelly McMath of Covington, Lady of the Villa Hills and Crescent Springs, Warden of the South. Thanks to Lord James Tuttle, King of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea, Commander of the Royal Fleet, consisting of the Narrow Fleet led by Flagship Caraxes and the Bloodstone Fleet led by Flagship Prince Damon. It's said that Lord Tuttle has been laughing at the Manderley's lack of seaborne experience. What kind of a port lord has no ability to sail out into the sea? Ha! Huh. Charlotte Oster, Corsair Queen of the Western Shivering Sea, commander of the Briny Fleet, whose flagship is the barnacle-encrusted Violet Hold Mercenaria. She carries the nacre inlaid shucking blade crass lover, and also thinks it's funny, but also thinks it's funny that Lord Tuttle thinks it's funny, because she thinks she's much more powerful than he is. We've seen what happens between these two. Our small council consists of Lord James Inkblade, the scholar and master of whispers. Grand Maester Surya of the Barrows is Cinder of the Citadel. Lord Robert Jacobs is master of coin. And Lord Daniel, the sneaky Russian, is master of ships. No one is supporting this show. I think you know what that means. We have faceless supporters who shall remain nameless. The lords and ladies in their castles include Lady Dyerlands of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. That means she was the first patron we ever had, as well as the first patron for Radio Westeros and the Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire podcast. Possibly others, too. I'm not sure. Lord Dan of the Red Mountains and Castle Great Bell is Breaker of the Second Stone. Lord Skip of the Velt is Lord of Castle Ganges. Gregor the Toasty is Lord of the Breadfort. Alicia Everlasting of the Greenblood is Lady of Desert Rose. Lord Ryan of Castle Stonegate is Guardian of the Rocky Mountain Pass. Lord Garen de Havilland is of Devil's Hand Keep. Ashlyn Winter, the Hawk's Eye, is Lady of Castle Skyfall. Lady Mikkel of Moonacre is leader of the Werewood Protectorate Alliance. The Lord of the Halls of Castle Hillcrest is wielder of the Valyrian Steel Machete Everglaze. Lord Alistair Whitaker is Lord of the Dawnhold. Lord Bemi Snugglebunny is Guardian of the Hidden Hundred Acre Werewood. 
dual wielding Glorious Morning and Little Light Wise. Brian the Defender is Lord of the Spear Fort and the Freelands, last scion of Clan McCulloch, strength and courage. The Bastard of the Wolfswood is first forester of the old gods, sworn to House Ironwearwood. Listen for the silence. Connor the Dungeon Master is Lord of Catamount Keep and guardian of the Smoky Mountain Pass. Lady Baelish is Dark Widow of Harrenhal. Lord Sidney Jesse the Fallborn is Lord of Blue Spring. Nevesa the Twinhearted is suspected skin changer, is holder of Castle Carahel. Sir Valentin of House to Jen is creator of the Game of Predictions. Lady Liana Kelly of Wolf Island is protector of the Steelhold. Our King's Justice is Sir Troy the Steady, wielder of Valyrian Steel Blade Fate. Lady Jane of House Celtigar is the Emerald of the Evening, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Axe Painkiller, Mistress of Sea Eagles, and Mistress of Ships. Elia of Upstate is Master of Coin. Grand Maester M. Elizabeth is middle daughter of Lyanna Mormont, first lady to forge both the Silver and Valyrian Steel Link. Bold Betha of House Copperhook, still waters run deep, Master of Laws. Our King's Guard is commanded by the Smiling Wolf, Lord Commander Stephen Stark, cartographer of kings who earned a white cloak through wisdom and learning as much as skill at arms. And good looking out, Lord Commander Stephen, doing his job just like a Lord Commander should. Recently pointed us to some people who were stealing our content, re-uploading it for, for views and money. And uh, that's the kind of thing that happens a lot on YouTube. It's good that we have people looking out for us. Our Queen's Guard is led by Lord Captain Commander Hema Hillmans, the Sellsword Sentinel. Lady Nymeria of House Seapurtle, Alexander of House Atreides from the Seat of Doom. I must not fear, fear is the mind killer. Becca the Bard, Songbird of the North. Sir Eric Redbeard Odinson, wielder of Tempest, a monstrous warhammer. Michonne the Melodious, star of Old Town, minds over masters. Sir Rambo, Knight of House Ganon, First Blood. Our beard guard is led by Lord Commander George the Golden, backed up by Sir Joshua O'Cart, the White Oak. Lady Rita of the Coppermane, the Unbound, Dance the Fervor, and Sir Jeff, Warden of the AC, Wielder of Triad, the multifaceted Beard of Platinum, Red and Brown. Stay Frosty! And finally, members of History of Westeros' Night's Watch. Lord Commander Benjen Umber, the Silent Giant, is Wielder of the Valyrian Steel Greatsword, Winter's Kiss, and he's backed up by First, Ra First Ranger Fabian Flowers, the Bastard of Greenshield, First Builder Patchface of Motley Wisdom, and First Steward Sir Jurion of the Torrentine, called... Pale wind. Thanks again for listening, everybody. Can't wait for next time. We'll see you then.